Welcome to the March 12th meeting of the Board of Trustees. Uh, we'll start with roll call. Yeah. Trustee Cox? Here. Trustee Snyder? Aye. Trustee Parsons? Here. Trustee Kinsley? Here. Trustee Hardman? Here. Uh, and next up we have uh, the flag salute, and we're fortunate to have a fifth grader from Blossom Hill here to leave us in, leave us in the flag salute. Uh, Abigail Athern is going to leave the flag salute for us. Uh, right here, yeah, sure. Please join me in a pledge of allegiance. Please place your right hand over your heart. Ready? Salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Abby. As a little token of appreciation, there's a chocolate you bring home and give to your parents. <laughs> or <excuse laughs> <the lecture. laughs> okay, next up we have uh, approval or amendment of today's agenda. Do we have a motion to approve or suggestions to amend? I'll second. Yes. Trustee Parsons? Aye. 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 Okay, now we have the Blossom Hill Elementary Schools Showcase and Principal Lisa Reynolds along with other folks and uh, math specialist Fran Mestrani will present. Well, good evening, board, Dr. Farber, Cabinet, and Michelle. Just really excited to be here tonight. Um, we are really looking forward to sharing with you our math specialist program. So tonight we'll be showcasing um, a little bit about how the program developed. And um, I'm here tonight, I'm very proud to have Fran Mastriani, our math specialist. And I have five of Blossom Hill's finest with me. Stella, would you stand? Where's Stella? There's Stella. And Ryan's here. Ryan, would you stand? And Alexa's here. And James is here. And Kate is here. All right. Thank you so much. So, um, I'm going to give you a little bit of background, and then Fran's going to share some of the work she's doing with Number Sense and Fluency. And then the board will have a chance to sharpen some of their conceptual understanding and their skills by engaging in a brief game with um, some of our students. So a few years ago, our data at Blossom Hill was showing a gap in many students' number sense. So in a nutshell, a child's understanding of what a number symbol means or represents can really be confusing. The five um, in place value represents the uh, conceptually like five marbles. And if it's in the 10 spot, it would be like 50 marbles. Or in the 100 spot, 500 marbles. Where many of us just learned um, by rote and we didn't really have that conceptual understanding. So that's a big part of number sense. Um, also, Number sense is also the relationship between numbers and the ability to perform mental math and using numbers in the real world. So while we attempted to alleviate these gaps in the general ed classroom, a second tier of support was really needed. And due to the most generous um, contribution of our home and school club, we were able to hire a math specialist. So with that said, we got very excited and we advertised and we couldn't find a math specialist. <laughs> I contacted the um, Santa Clara County Office of Ed, the Santa Cruz County Office of Ed, San Jose State, Santa Clara University, and we just didn't have any candidates. So Fran stepped up and took some classes. So it's really worked out well. We hit the jackpot. Um, so this year, we uh, at the last year was our first year, and at the end of last year, um, we looked at the program and made a few tweaks, and have continued this year, and it continues to grow. Fran has continued to educate herself. She took um, three classes, 
three six unit classes last year and then this year she attended the um, a math workshop at a Silomar for a weekend and she's also gone to the Silicon Valley math initiative meetings with Arcia um, monthly this year so she continues to grow her skill set so with that said she's going to share a little bit about number sense and num the relationships with numbers and then we'll play a, a game for just a couple minutes there's so much that I want to talk about. Uh, for those of you who know me, you know that when I stepped into this job, I immediately fell in love with what I was doing. I, I have so much fun doing it. So I talk to people, and I think I make them crazy sometimes about how excited I get. But um, our focus, we decided, was going to be on number sense and fluency. And I just made up some charts because it's the kind of person that I am. Um, just to reiterate what Lisa said, that... <coughs> So we think of number, sense, and fluency, and we think of just knowing your math facts off the top of your head. Okay, if I put this up here. Sorry. Yeah. Um, I hope so. Okay. So number, sense, <laughs> is you know. just um, knowing the, seeing the relationship between numbers and how they work, being flexible with numbers, being able to take them apart and put them back together. We teach students a lot about um, adding and subtracting and multiplying, dividing, using place value. Not your typical algorithm that most of the adults in this classroom learn. The ability to spot a reasonable answer. So if they're adding a number and they come up with a number that's smaller than the two numbers they started out with, they should be able to look at that and figure out that's not, something's wrong. Second, fluency is more than just memorizing your facts and the procedures that we all learned. It's the ability to solve problems accurately and quickly and using different methods and strategies that we teach in the Common Core. I have to say, when we first started teaching Common Core in the district, that's when I really fell in love with math. I used to hate math as a student, so those of you who I work with right now, I just hate math as a kid. So this changed a lot for me. Um, it's also, fluency is also demonstrating efficiency with numbers and knowing more than one way to solve a problem, okay? One way we go about that is we use a number line, which I put up on the wall behind us. And if you notice, there's colored dots on the number line. Math is all about patterns of numbers. So this particular number line we use from kindergarten up to fifth grade. In kindergarten, we start with the students skip counting by fives and tens and twos because that's what they learn in the primary grades. First and second graders do that as well. And then when we get to third grade, we start to use it as a way for students to see multiples of numbers and factors of numbers when they're multiplying. And then in fourth and fifth grade, when you have to um, reduce your fractions and things like that, you can look at the, the color-coded numbers and kind of get an idea to know where to start when trying to reduce your fractions. Every, um, the code is in the beginning with the numbers two through 12. Any number that has a two, a red um, dot over the top of it is a multiple of two. The green is all, they're all multiples of three and so on down the line. I, I have uh, one fifth grade class, Mr. Joannides, his students use this a lot. The other thing that I just learned this year that I, I went into Lisa and I said, you just have to hear about this. I don't know if anybody heard, has heard of digital roots. Anybody who knows math in this room probably has heard about digital roots. But like I said, <coughs> math is all about patterns in numbers. So from a young age, students know if a number has an even number in the ones <coughs> place, that it's even. And as you get older, it's a multiple of two. You know, if you have a five in the uh, ones place, <coughs> a five, that it's a multiple of five. Or if you have a zero in the ones place, a five or a zero in the ones place is multiple of five. A zero in the ones place is multiple of ten. You can also look at patterns of the numbers three, six, and nine. That um, if you look at the products of all these numbers, they do form a pattern. And the thing called digital roots is when you add up the product of the number, say 42, so the digital root of this number 42 is 6. Digital roots are the numbers 1 through 9. So if we get up to 99, and we add the 9 plus the 9, we get 18, and we add the 1 and the 8 up, so the digital root of 99 is 9. So looking at those numbers, you can... Another way of looking at the patterns of numbers, I had to hide that. Any number that has a digital root of three, six, or nine has three as a factor. 
any number that has a digital root of 3, 6, or 9 is even, has 6 as a factor as well. And any number with a digital root of 9 has 9 as a factor. So these are very quick ways for students to look at numbers when they're starting to reduce fractions to figure out where to start. That just boggled my mind when I saw that. <laughs> I shared it with everybody. <laughs> Lisa said, how do you do that tonight? So um, we do a lot with dice. We do a lot with dominoes and the number line and just looking at patterns of numbers. So tonight, my first and second graders that are here with you, are going to play with our trustees, are going to play Sums Up, okay? You'll each get a game board, you your partner, you'll, you will each get a bag of di uh, dominoes. You'll take turns, take out the domino, add up the dots on the domino, and cover up the rocket ship on your board. Typically the first person who covers up all the rocket ship wins, but we're just going to do a shortened version. Okay, are you guys ready? Okay, come on up and I'll show you who you can play with. Hi, how are you? Hello. Do we share with you or will you, will you choose our own? Do I get one of those? You gotta help me here. Here, we can put this right there. I mean, Zoe, you can put this right down there. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Okay. What do I do with these? Oh, these are your okay. Okay. Do I, Yeah, do I empty them or so just leave them in the bag? What are you supposed to do? You can leave them in the bag of store, you know. There we go. <laughs> Who gets to look at the numbers? You or me? Right. Uh -huh. uh, my binder. <laughs> oh. Okay, cool. Let's get it. Well, you know, so we'll go I got to okay. see a report. I missed it. What do I do? Okay. Cool. Six plus two. Uh, so I think they're outside the brain. These are amazing. Can you turn the numbers down? So did she make the, these grids okay. herself or is this some program? Back when I was a kid. This one. It's pretty good. Some of the best information we've ever seen. From a program, I mean, to see. Oh, uh, okay. Got it. So I have one really five. Good. Yeah. I'm out of roll. I know. I mean, this is the way. Maybe that's why it's Yeah, probably. Oh, bummer. It's stuck again. That's too bad. Mm. Yes. Uh, six and four is ten. Oh, Oops, so four and four is eight, I've already got eight, so I can put this off inside, right? Okay. Ooh, wow. I'm lucky. Six is high. Damn. Three and two is five, and then I'll suck it down too. Nice. It could be. It could be here. Maybe. Cool. Good for you. Um, it's like three. One is three. Yeah, I'm back on track here. <laughs> awesome. Did you ever play this with your mom or dad? Hi. How are you? You probably should, right? Three and one is four, but I've already got one, so I'll put that on. Um, yeah, we're tied now. I was winning there for a bit. Oh, it sometimes goes to the So five and four is going. Nine. Okay. This one, sure. Yes. Five and one is six. Ooh, I get to squeeze that one in there. Ooh, you lucked out. There's, there's probably like only one of those, right? Six and six is twelve. Yes. Well. I got zero zero here too. Are you winning? I'm tied. Oh. We're dead even. <laughs> 
Oh, yeah. 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 That might be the time to end it when you're tied. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you, did, you had a repeat? Six, that's a repeat. So, so if I move that down over to the middle of there, that would look like a five, wouldn't it? Six and zero is six, so I've got that one, alright. Look away. Eleven. Four, three, seven, I'm stuck. Go with the game. How do I do it? Oh, they're out, okay. Okay. Five, zero, You're down five. to one to go. I have four. Whose turn is it? Is it your turn? Better hurry up then. Because I'm going to win. Oh, okay. Five, three is eight. Two. Catch it up. Am I supposed to guess? That's not the one. Almost. Okay. So I've got a five. Three. That's like a six plus a two. That's going to be an eight. Oh, I already have an eight. Looks like you win. All right. Six. Oh, one more. Good job. Thanks for playing with me. She did win. Oh, no, I've got by, I've by got three. Six to me. I got, I got six. Victory! Well, thanks for playing. I'm glad you won. I had another two. No, I lost. I got I lost by three. Your turn. Here. This is your last name for us. Okay, so what's your name again? The first one to get their oh, what's your name again? Okay. Tate and Joy. Thank you for oh, playing. Thank you very much. Oh, I have a two. My first three. I know. Yeah. Thank you. Hey, you know what? You can share. Thank you. Don't think she will. I know, right, I know, I know. Oh, what's your name? Kate. Uh, Kate Langer? Yes, there you go. We'll take a quick bow after you yeah. I love the light bulb. I love it. I don't think you do. I think it's like the never change the fly. It's a magic thing. I know. I just thought about that today. They just keep coming. We should always stack them. Thank you for coming. Thank you for playing. Thank you very much. James and Ryan. No witty t shirt on today. So while we're wrapping it up, there was also one other. Um, oh, sorry. Thank you so much. We had, um, oh, sorry, friend. I just want to take a quick poll. Okay. So, of the five of us, who won? Who lost? Ha! Raise your hand we if you won. Think they all lost. We, we were, we were, we were pretty even. Still, it was good. John, I lost, I lost also. I so. lost. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Kids win we pretty much. Similar game for um, subtracting and multiplying. So the upper grade students get to track this too. So um, the other word that I know I learned during my my programs at school, but I forgot it until I started doing math again that most of the students in, that I work with right now in the beginning of the year or last year were not able to look at this domino and know that there were four dominoes on it. Being able to look at the patterns on here and immediately know that there's three and one is called sub <laughs> subitizing? Subitizing. That's the word, yes. I, I never say it correctly. Vocabulary. Subitizing. <laughs> most of the students that come to see me now are able to look at this and they don't have to count each individual dot, which is amazing. So I'm just really proud of all of them, and they've done a great job. So thank you, thank you so much. Thank you.
questions for us? Nope. Nope. I don't think so. Yeah, good stuff. Thank you. Okay, moving on. We have uh, next up is public comment. This is the opportunity for members of the public to address the governing board on um, any item. We have several yellow cards, but most of them are for one of the later agenda items. So the one I have right now for general public comment is from Carson Rosenbaum. Hey. Hi, how are you? Good. Hey. Go um, my say. name is Carson, and I'm in first grade at Dave's Avenue. And for my science fair project, I tested the water at Dave's Avenue. And a lot of the fountains had high levels of heavy metals in them. And they put um, jugs of water outside, but kids are still drinking from the water fountains, and I think that they should shut them down, so that way no one still drinks from the water. Wow, still bad great medicine. idea. Okay. That should happen. <laughs> Sorry. You can't there, vote on that tonight. Yeah, hang on. Was there anything else you want to say? No. Okay. Thank you for letting us know. So I, I do want to just say that we are aware of this. We've been told about this by... Um, other parents and other folks involved with the schools and we've got people here looking at it very closely in fact I think we expect to get some official laboratory test results within the next few days and then we'll know more about what we can and should do but thank you very much for bringing this to our attention appreciate it anybody else okay um, now we're on to uh, remarks and communications from various groups. So we've got uh, Blossom Hill Home and School Club up first. I think Mrs. Mastriani and Mrs. Reynolds and the children both can help. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dave's Home and School Club? Yes. Thank <laughs> you. Uh, we are the green team. Where would, should we stand? Uh, right up to the podium, please. Okay, well, all the kids can gather around. Go in order. Stand in order with your cards, and then you can go through the door. Okay, uh, my name is Lisa Hansen, and I run the Dave's Avenue Green Team. And we've been working really hard over the last few years to try to build uh, ecological warriors and make uh, students stewards of the environment and this year we have a particular campaign in mind and we've recognized that the school district could probably stand to eliminate single-use plastic straws from the school cafeterias and the students here would like to um, tell you why. All right, so one at a time, just read your card and then go back to the wall. We would like the school district to eliminate single-use plastic straws from our cafeteria. Kids do not need straws to drink from their milk cartons. We do not need plastic um, wrapped sport packets with straws inside. We think that the district district would save money by having a stack of napkins and a stack of sporks available to kids who need them. We do not know the dis the district's current costs though. 2,400 lunch napkins sell at Costco for $24. Um, enough for f seven weeks of lunches sold at Dave's Avenue. Each day, the U.S. throws 500 million plastic straws into the trash, and many make it into the ocean to harm sea life. That's enough to wrap around the globe 2.5 times every day. More than, more than half, half the trash in the ocean is plastic waste. Straws are one of the top 10 waste items found during beach cleanups. We want to <coughs> out, we want to do our part to reduce plastic waste that gets into the ocean and harms sea life, especially the sea turtles. Dave's green team collected 100 signatures on our petition for no more straws, plus 115 letters for AB1884 and one 
in one day at school. We made a skit for our, our assembly at school. We made a video for the assembly men for AB1884. We visited Evan Lowe's office in Cupertino. Mm -hmm. So, uh, in summary, we noticed that in our school cafeteria, there's a box of straws, single-use plastic straws, and there are plastic-wrapped spork packets that include a straw and a plastic spork and a napkin. We would like to propose that we eliminate the straws because kids do not need to drink milk out of the carton with a straw, and that is the only beverage being offered at the hot lunch program. We also think that... Uh, that we can eliminate the plastic wrapper on the spork packet if we just have a pile of napkins and a pile of sporks. And ideally, they would be compostable sporks, but I understand that that is a cost issue, and I do not know the budget for the, for the napkins at the school. We have lots of other things to discuss, and I just want to say that we are working very collaboratively with Lexington School, and their green team leader, they call it Lexicology, is Lisa Keller. And she and I work collaboratively together. And we, our views here today represent Lexington School as well. Thank you. Right. I'd like to give kudos to Lisa Hansen. I mean, in her time at Dave's has built a real community about you know all kinds of things, whether it was carpooling and bicycling and you know it's green team but it's educational and it makes people question a lot of things we just take for granted absolutely and she has done it all on her own time uh, and has really sort of changed I think a lot of the, the dynamic the, the language people use and you know even putting up signs over every faucet of, you know just to think thank you yeah we do we've been working pretty hard we built a a school garden with an outdoor classroom and we have campus beautification days and we have all kinds of things that the kid moms come up to me in Safeway and say wow my daughter never <laughs> took a two minute shower until you came along <laughs> and we're doing all kinds of things with water conservation um, sorting the trash on the playground which hadn't happened before the uh, green team started doing that and tomorrow we have a big mascot like Sharky coming to uh, the playground who's Captain Green Waste from a company who has called Green Waste. But we're not even in their jurisdiction, but they heard what we're doing and they want to come help us out. So uh, we're doing raffles a couple times a year for the Trash Free Tuesday and the straws is a big thing that is causing trash uh, people to not be trash free, especially the people who are taking hot lunch. So if we can eliminate the straws, even the hot lunch kids can be trash free and that would be great. Mm -hmm. Thank, right, thank you. you. Thank you. So, Marla, who's in charge of cafeteria stuff these days? <clears throat> we'll have to talk to Chris and see what he can do. Yeah, or just find, I mean, some get some facts first, right? Figure out, yeah, yeah, the facts of whether they can do it for, you know, just um, sanitary reasons. Yeah, right. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, um, next up, the uh, Lex Homan School Club. Anyone here? Uh, Van Meter? Nope. Fisher? Okay, uh, teacher Good evening. Uh, so we uh, just completed our second trimester of standards based report cards, and I just want to remind you how much we're doing. <laughs> Teachers really going above and beyond uh, developing the materials, assessments. Assessing the assessments, making copies of the assessments. We have artifacts for the report cards. I mean, for each each parent conference, you have like a stack that thick. Um, it's it's really good quality work. It takes a lot of time and dedication. I appreciate all the support of our district staff in that. Um, the association is super excited to participate in the uh, conversations with the search team for the superintendent search, and we are meeting as an executive board with HYA tomorrow afternoon. We strongly encourage the community to take the community survey. It's on the district website, um, so that I think is open until the 22nd. There's also a community meeting at Fisher tomorrow night. Super important to give input to that search committee. Um, we also want to appreciate the board and the district's response um, to our request around school safety, and we look forward to those opportunities um, across the district happening on Wednesday, 314, uh, to foster inclusion and provide a safe environment for all of our students and staff. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, classified union? 
uh, LGEF. Okay, I'll be quick. Um, most important thing, by the way, that, I, I, I have to come to this meeting. I'm glad I picked this particular one. Yeah, this was a really good one. A um, couple quick things. So probably the most important, a couple of you guys were at our last board meeting where we approved an $810,000 grant, which is, of course, nowhere near is where our dream is, but it's still a huge increase over last year, 54% growth from the 510000 for last year. So it's a really significant thing because we really will be writing checks to the district next year for eight hundred and ten. So I'm very pleased to announce that. To announce that. In terms of other ways to make more money um, for the district, we are um, um, <clears throat> we are having a March Madness event. At least one of you guys, who's being minds with Moiner, um, <laughs> is coming. And uh, this is at the March Madness event, Thursday, March 29, 6.30 to 9.30 at Loma Brewing. It's going to be a really fun event. Um, $100 to get in, but unlimited beer and wine and all sorts of booths, photo booths and uh, music and an auction and some other things. So consider that. Um, we're launching a new program. This has been successful in many other districts. It's a realtors program. It's called the LGF Dean's List of Realtors. We, it's already off to a great start. We've already briefed, uh, presented at five, three of the five offices and we're booked to go to the other two. All five of the main offices of, um, the, you know, like Intero and and uh, Sereno and all that. Um, we've already signed up a bunch of realtors. I don't know the counts. Well, it's well over twenty thousand dollars already. But it, it, you know, the good thing is these things are recurring. We do this every year. Um, if you happen to uh, tomorrow, we're sending out an uh, email to parents about it. A, so they know what we're doing to try to raise money. B, so they can tell their realtors to please join. If any of you know a realtor, have them come to our website. It's actually a really good opportunity for realtors to promote themselves to potential clients. Um, the Fisher Technology Showcase, uh, Thursday, May 10th, 5 to 7 p.m. We, we're going to invite, as we did last year, all the digital and STEM clubs to showcase their work and invite fifth grade families to see all the digital and STEM activities at Fisher. It's actually a really great event. I know my kids enjoyed it last year. When is it again? This one is uh, Thursday, May 10th, from 5 to 7 p.m. It was a really good event last year. So um, um, it, the idea is to connect fifth grade incoming students with the opportunities yeah, they have outside the regular just, school. Very good. Um, and then the last thing I want to mention is that we're recruiting for next year's LGF board. We're looking for people, you know, we take anybody, but of course, really, it's especially useful if you have skills in marketing, sales type, you know, functions, because you're, you know, the, the, it's, believe it or not, there are actually people that don't mind making a call to someone home at six at night going, please support our schools, you know? And those are really valuable type people. So please send them our way. Um, if you have any other questions, that's all I have. I'm signing up right now, so stop giving me great. I just signed up today. This <laughs> I thought I was doing it again. right now. It's on my calendar. Thank you for that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And then last on the list, we have the superintendent's report. Just Thank you. The meeting continues. So I just want to let the board know that um, in the last few days I have visited, I've been to all of the schools and I'm on my second round and some third round visiting the schools and I'm really having a really nice time. Today I saw the science fair at Van Meter and I'm so impressed by what the students are doing. I was looking at some of the the topics and I thought wow I, I really I really think that what the students now are doing in second third and fourth grade I did in seventh eighth <laughs> and ninth grade I mean I know I'm older but but really I mean I'm just amazed and people seem very dedicated and warm and are so eager to show off they're, you know, I don't mean show off, show off what they're doing and share what they're doing. So I um, had a meeting last week, you know, kind of before this meeting, and it, it's just everything's been really great. So I think you are going to have great candidates to come here, and I think that it's a very desirable place to live, work, and learn. So. Great. Thanks. Marlon, anything from you or no? I don't think so. Yeah. Okay, moving on, we have next the consent agenda. Items to be uh, proposed and approved in one full suit. Any, anything to 
So I don't want to take anything off, but I would like that in the future we actually post the contracts online. Um, it, it seems either it's just a lack of transparency requiring someone to come down to the DO to physically review contracts. Um, so I, I, I'd like to sort of establish you mean, that. You mean the service contracts? Any contract up for approval. Maybe something under 2500 is de minimis, but service contracts I think should be posted online. Any comments, questions? I mean, uh, I mean, I agree that there's probably a threshold like under which we don't need to. I don't know what the threshold would be, though, whether it's 2500 or 25000 or what. I mean, because otherwise we'll be posting lots and lots of contracts, right? I don't know. Is that the worst thing in the world? Not necessarily. I just don't know. I mean... Yeah. I don't know. What's the mechanism paper? for those, like, attached to or just Yeah, I mean, kind of like here. So see the... Yeah. The, the, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the hyperlinks, so yeah. Yeah, you just... Yeah. I mean, it's... Logistically, you could, but you probably just want to have a threshold. I mean, I don't, you could just list. put them on. The list makes sense, but yeah. not the entire. No, well, that's what I we have. So if you score, we, we do have the list. Oh, you do have the list. And it has, oh, have yeah, it has the service the provider and the, oh, okay. the, the service. He's talking about the actual the contract oh, okay. itself. Yeah. I don't see, other than ones like that, maybe a student-related matter that would have a student's name on it. Those we would not do, but those are contracts as well. But any service contract, I don't see. Does any, do you? I just, I mean, I'm sensitive to not, like, make extra work for folks if it, it's challenging, right? It's just a matter of we have them. putting them into a, a PDF format and yeah. putting them up. I mean, I think that would be great. Okay. I agree that transparency there is good. Yeah. When you see it, asking you is that an issue, do you think, Neil, for your contract? They're thick. Yeah. <laughs> well, it depends on who it's with, but yeah. yeah. I have a question, and sure. maybe a question and a comment. Um, I look at the warrant register every time it shows up on the board meeting packet. I don't know how many pages it was, 12, 17. It totaled a little bit less than a million dollars. Does anybody review that and say, yeah, I don't see any... Uh, Abnorm abnormalities or any issues that may uh, need further investigation? Sometimes there's questions, I mean, about a particular contract and what it's for, because if you don't have the actual contract up there, sometimes it's hard to know what the purpose is. And on the actual contract, I'll give an example. Um, on this board packet, we had the 86K for technology at the county. One might not know that that is an annual contract that we do every single year for our fiber optics and other things that we have for our internet services here in the district and so forth by just looking at what we put on there. But if you put the contract on, that might eliminate a question. For the CBOC, there's a warrant register, and Martin, every for every meeting, which was quarterly, he put a cover letter on it saying, I reviewed the warrant register and everything seems to be in order. Something to that effect. Well, so I think that's John's question. It's, it's, not, it's more along the lines of, are we Is the it? board, are, are we the only reviewers of this, or no. are, are we a bit more of a... Because if we're the only check and balance, no. then I, I would agree that we've got to Again, like John said, I, 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 I go through it quickly. I look for patterns. I look right. for things that might look like they're unusual. It took me some months, uh, you know, when I started on the board to yeah. figure out what's normal and what's not. And I think my first hand for board meetings, I had stupid questions about the warrant register that I've sort of gone past at this point. No. Um, you know, I currently do that. I currently do that every, for every Okay, yeah. and that, that's a good thing. Yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, when I was doing budgets in my old world, uh, I'd be looking at the, the top 5% and I'd be drilling down to make sure that somebody had reviewed and approved that expense. And in this case, there's some pretty big ticket items on there that are absolutely legitimate, and I know that somebody is doing it, but I think it would be a good thing to have some kind of a statement on there by, by someone, at least, oh, okay. to, that we reviewed the warrant register and there's no issue to... Yeah. Just a... It's a good point. Yeah. And just, and I know that when a requisition is made, you know, and, and I noticed there were lots of them for school supplies. So somebody purchased something, so either they had prior approval to do that 
or they had approval from their principal, then the principal signs, it comes over, and I know that there are multiple signatures, so I think, you Close know, that's... Close through three of us. Yeah, that's, that's what I think was already part yeah. But you want a statement. I don't know. I mean, it's actually what might be helpful is that it's just a bunch of probably new board members, and a lot of people who aren't in finance or accounting don't realize there's a whole process for every check has to have a PO or approval, and I think maybe even a 15-minute presentation sometime just sort of saying, here's the process before it ever gets to the warrant register, so you have confidence that we have well, yeah, the process checks that, and balances. But still, you know, it's a, okay, it, not, it's not necessary, but I think it would eliminate some of the uh, other questions yeah. then. Uh, so, I'll anyway. just send you guys a link. So my brother is the CFO at the Greater Boston Food Bank, and they made a video about three or four years ago of like how every check gets processed and written. It's, it's very tongue in cheek. It's actually kind of funny with like a little music overdub and all that. Okay. Let's make a video. Thank you. That's it. <laughs> uh, okay. Anyway, so do we have a motion to approve the consent agenda? I'll make a motion to approve it. Right. Alex, second. Yeah. Trustee Snyder? Yes. Trustee Parsons? Aye. Trustee Kunstman? Aye. Trustee Aye. Aye. Okay, next up we have uh, Neil with the uh, safety and emergency plan. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Um, thanks, Chair. Good evening. We'll talk about safety and emergency planning. I'll try to keep things moving. A little long, a little wordy. You know, I tend to stammer and stutter a little bit, but I'll try to keep it going. We have a oh, Tim. It's not so great. It's not so great. There we go. We'll try to center it now. So, okay. So we're going to talk about the district's uh, school safety and emergency planning. Uh, kind of the process. What we have here. The agenda tonight will talk about uh, Senate Bill 187, the Comprehensive School Safety Plan, the district's emergency plan, uh, the drills that we perform, our emergency containers, the uh, training we do, and some next steps, and then we'll wrap it all up. Oh, we're going to need some help. Okay, Senate Bill 187, Comprehensive School safety plan. Here's a little brief history how it was came about. Back in 1997, Senate Bill 187 was introduced, approved, and signed by the governor. It was put into the Ed Code, and it was to create a comprehensive school safety plan. The original plan had a sunset clause, which uh, it would come to an end on January 1st, 2000. In 1999, they had Senate Bill 334, which in essence said we're going to remove that sunset clause and make this a permanent law, and we will have comprehensive school safety plans moving forward. It also added the March 1st requirement for updating the plan and the report on the status every July 1st on the school accountability report card. The 2004, they, in 2004, the legislator and the governor recast and renumbered it because they have to keep things moving. And they had both a uh, plan for both the Senate and the Assembly. And that's where we came up with the current SB 187. The intent of that legislation was to provide support to public schools as they develop a mandated comprehensive pl safety plan. It's a result of systematic planning process that includes strategies and aimed prevention and education of potential incidents involving crime and violence on the campuses, on school campuses. And it should be pointed out that it was about educating prevention crime, SB 187 for crime on the campuses themselves, not things that could come from the outside, but how to prevent crimes to, against students and staff. And from what I've been told from other people, and it was pretty much all grown right up through gang issues that were happening at schools. So they were trying to do, uh, take care of those issues. So that was basically the purpose of the 187, to create a safe environment on the campus for the kids to be going to school. The Ed Code 3280 outlines the requirements that all children operate at kindergarten or first to 12th grade at each school, individual school, write its own 
safety plan relevant to the needs of that individual school. They're not supposed to be a cookie cutter plan. Each school has to have a plan for its unique situation. And to, to come to that, to do that, they said the school site council will be the one who will create the plan, but they can delegate it to the school safety planning committee to come up with a little bit smaller plan. But the whole point of it was to be, this is what's happening in our school, we're creating a plan for our school. The safety plan is supposed to be strategic in nature, strategies to create a safe campus. It's not supposed to have tactical information in it on basically how we're going to be doing some of this stuff. And the Ed Code specifically allows districts to keep tactical responses out of the school plan. And law enforcement ed professionals encourage you do not put your tactical information in there. That's basically giving somebody who wants to create a problem what you're going to do. And in fact, if you've been in the paper, the recent Florida shooting case, the uh, Q shooter said he knew exactly what to do because he went through the active shooter training on that campus part that he knew exactly what was going to happen, so he knew what to do to overcome that. So therefore, they say, keep it strategic. If it is your tactical plan or what you're going to do, it does not have to be posted to the public. It does not have to be on the website or on any public plan. But there is one. What? There is, there is one that is tactical that's maintained at the sites. We, like that's part of the next steps for where we're going. Requirements. 11 items are required to be on the school safety plan. These are the 11 items. You'll notice they're all basically related to school-related issues to keep a safe campus. Um, suspension, expulsion, expulsion, tongue-tied, discrimination procedures and such. You'll notice the items involve a climate on campus where this, and here we work with the schools and the student services to develop a lot of these programs. And a lot of these things you've been seeing uh, actively through the year, such as the annual child abuse reporting for all staff members, an updated suspension form that increases other means of corrective interventions, the district safe route to schools program and dealing with the town on school transportation issues for uh, school uh, safe ingress and egress, and uh, the schools have implemented a culture club that are focusing on safe and orderly environments and school discipline. Notice that on there it has disaster procedures as part of it. We don't really have emergency procedures. That's a separate form. So disaster is what they're keying on is on earthquake preparedness at school sites. It also should be noted that while these 11 items are required to be on the SB 187, you can add more to your own that fits the need of your campus. So if you feel you want to add more to your, your plan for safety, you're allowed to do that. Right now we're using a generic state template, and part of the next steps we're going to see how we might be able to change that. Let's talk about the district's emergency plan. The emergency plan that we have right now was created by a committee during the 2014 school year. The committee was individuals from the district, but the district office personnel, um, each elementary school and middle school. We also had a representative, the RSO, SRO at the time from the police department and the safety coordinator for Santa Clara County Fire. And we spent a year coming up with the current emergency plan. The emergency plan follows what's called the incident command structure, and that is complies with the state mandate from the standardized emergency management system. The emergency plan tells us how to put together the structure for an incident command if a, a, a disaster strikes. And I want to use the keyword there, disaster strikes. There's a difference between disasters and incidents. A disaster in this case, what we'll work for is a major earthquake where resources from first responders would be very limited and response times may be delayed. So this district, the school has to set up its own command structure to take charge of the situation. It also follows the same federal national incident management system. At the beginning of each school year, the school site reviews and updates, updates its incident command structure. If there's no changes, they make no changes. But every year there's some staff changes, roles, responsibilities change, so they create 
a new structure that fits uh, their needs. And they, uh, each site conducts periodic training on these procedures and roles that the, each person has. And they do drills or tabletop exercises. And they also do some activities such as activating their incident command structure <coughs> and do student release drills. And like I said before, it should be emphasized that the school plan and ICS is meant for large scale disasters where first responders are, are taxed. If on a smaller scale incident where there is uh, plenty of first responders, the police department or the fire department will arrive scene and they will set up an instant command center. Once they have set, set up theirs, the school gives it over to them, we assist them, but they take charge of the situation. Next question on that one, Neil? Yeah. I mean, every school has communications, the walkie talkies. Mm -hmm. Are those, can the, could the police department or fire, do they have the ability to tap into that or do we have to like scramble and find one that they can use? I could bring that up uh, later. That's what I'm working on right now. Okay. But the, the, the short answer is right now, uh, we have a s s base station over at this town's emergency operations center. That said, it does not work with their system. But they have the ability to. They do have use the ability, that. but we are trying to upgrade it, make it easier for them to do it right now. But to tap into their system, they have a very complex system that's tied into the entire county okay. communication system, and it's we, we really don't have access to it. But the, they have the ability with the base station to access our system. Us at the yes. district office. Okay. They went from there out to the school sites. Okay. But we are trying to approve that. Along with the uh, emergency plan, when we developed the emergency plan, uh, we decided that each school, the emergency plan is pretty much a static plan. It, it follows the straight incident command system from the standardized uh, SIM systems. We needed something that was for that site. So we developed what we call the grab and go binder at each school site. The binder resides in the office on the, next to the uh, administrative assistants on their, uh, in their desk. And it contains certain information. It has site maps, a location of utility shutoffs, evacuation maps, uh, the incident command structure team for the campus, and medical needs, any special medical needs of any staff or student. In the event of an emergency where they have to evacuate, the administrative assistant would take that binder and leave the building. It would go with the, them out to their uh, evacuation site. If they set up their incident command center or system, it would res uh, reside with them. Once the first responders come, whether it be police or fire, depending on the situation, they would have that information to give to them if, if necessary. We've also developed grab-and-go binders that are at the Los Gatos Police Department. We have four binders at the Police Operations Center, which the uh, commander at the time, uh, the uh, shift commander, has access to. There's also a master binder which has all the school sites grab-and-go information at the police headquarters. And this is, they requested this, we put it together with the, I put it together with the, the um, Police Department's SRO last year. And the they would have information, same information in, is in that that is in the schools without the medical information in there. So if they were to respond to an uh, intruder on the campus and they have heard in the radio or something that it's Blossom Hill and they're in room B6, they would have a map of B6 before they even got there, they know exactly where to go. Also, I'm currently working with the fire department to develop grab-and-go binders for the fire department. They will reside, though, in the master fire control panel since in any fire department you can have a number of rigs responding so they can't sit in the same truck. And that will have information that's more pertinent for the fire department, such as where hydrants are, uh, hazardous materials may be on campus, um, where there's lock boxes for keys to get on campus, et cetera. And those are currently being in process of uh, being put together. Is there only one grab-and-go binder? I mean save an earthquake and admins room collapses are we now we don't have any other at the site we only have one and part, part of the reason I, is because with all of the information in it it also has class rosters class up there's so much updating to constantly do if there were several and it'd be a little bit tedious and difficult for them to do so they do have just the one 
Okay, emergency drills. The Ed Code requires school sites to conduct and record drills at a certain, certain frequency depending upon the age group or whatever, what their grade. So the Ed Code requires, uh, let's see, section 32001 on fire drills requires all elementary schools to do one fire drill per month during the school year and requires the middle school to do four fire drills a year. And Ed Code 32282 for earthquakes requires four earthquake drills at the elementary school and two drills at the middle school. You can combine those drills together. So in one month, you could do an earthquake drill, which is basically a like duck and cover, followed by a fire drill and an evacuation. While not required by the Ed Code, we, the district, require each school sites to conduct at least two lockdown drills per year. And these drills are all recorded and kept in the office. Uh, the site administrator determines the schedule when you're going to uh, occur. Generally what I've seen is they will make announce the first at the beginning of the year and then at the end of the year they're unannounced drills. The staff doesn't know when they're happening. And at least once a year the fire department comes and observes the fire drills. So, Neil, I've got a quick yeah. question. I, I think part of the genesis of, of getting this presentation to us was a hope that we would get a view on checking what would be done. Like our all the elementary sites doing the one fire drill a month and the four earthquake drills a year, middle school, et cetera, and the each site doing the two lockdown drills a year. Do we, in the do, do we have that kind of audit or do we do that kind of audit? To, well, it, it's up to it, their plan is in the back. They're, they're the appendix in, in there showed their plan for the year for the drills, and they follow those plans. Um, so uh, we don't do an audit to ensure they do it. It's the, the site administrator, is, it's, they're required by Ed Code to do it, so we just assume that they are doing the drills as is scheduled. And I can actually kind of follow it because whenever they do a fire drill, they have to put the system into test. And I get an email alert when the system's been put into test, so I can tell when a fire drill is starting and, be, and ending. We do have a, we have developed a system that, not really a system, but a, um, Google Doc type of thing where they would register the drills to us, but it um, has to be more closely monitored, I would say. So th th that might be one question. Is there something we, we should be doing more centrally for the district office to make sure that the drills are more than It was a note I, I just That's made. I idea. said to Marla, you know, in talking with the principals, just you know, the emergency plans, updates, you know, check on those drills. I, I saw them in the back of the book, you know, and, um, you know, just a, a follow-up. Yeah. They're, they're given a checklist at the beginning of the year at the admin retreat of their, their responsibilities and roles, you know, and we have to assume that they're following the procedures. We also get the updates for the emergency plan, and um, they keep their it's in their best interest to keep that grab and go binder up to get with all that the correct information. So it's let me ask the two principals that are here. Are you following those drills at your schools? Yeah, it's a lot of drills. <laughs> yeah, it seems like it. Especially for the elementary school. Yeah, monthly fire drills. That seems much more frequent than when I was a kid. But I we get some impromptu ones. However. Yeah, the burnt popcorn in the clubhouse is always a good part. I think the part that we could um, improve on is centralizing that those grab and go binders to make sure that they're updated and so forth at the sites. I think that we do get notification of their drills through their um, weekly letters and those kinds of things. Okay, emergency containers. Each school site has a 20-foot cargo container, and we have a 10-foot one over at the, the warehouse for the district office that has supplies, disaster supplies, basically set up if we have an earthquake-type situation. And they're meant to be if we have a situation where we are going to be here for a while. Inside the containers, there is search and rescue equipment. A portable generator, portable lighting, first aid kits, large first aid kits, triage blankets, emergency food and water, 
emergency blankets, uh, the student release uh, supplies that they need for the student release, miscellaneous supplies such as flashlights, batteries, portable toilets, that, toilet paper, that kind of stuff. The emergency supplies include water and nut-free protein bars. And we really made sure we got nut-free protein bars. They were replaced in the 2015 with the five-year shelf life, and so in 2020 we will replace the supplies once again. We, we have enough supplies, minimum supplies, to keep people sustained for about two days. In there. And some school sites have added a few other things that are, they feel special for their site. Uh, some sites keep their emergency uh, incident command system information in there. Some keep extra supplies. Uh, as you can see in the Canada, this is one for van meter. There's plenty of room to, to add other items in there. Training. Yeah, you also have a, each classroom has like a grab and go each backpack. Each classroom has a grab and go backpack that is um, just a basic thing to do. It's a short term situation that they can be out there if it's maybe a 20 minute half hour type thing um, if it's a longer period then they would open the emergency container uh, they have basic things in there a, a small first aid kit uh, some personal items you know there's a visor and cape for sun some a vest poncho space blankets a whistle we also um, some tissues they also, the school, I believe they keep their class rosters in there. They keep cards. They have red cards or stuff that they would hold up if there's a problem. So the school has added some stuff. They were pretty generic bags that were delivered to us. They initially had some food supplies, but we took those out because it's very difficult to keep uh, up in all the classrooms. And they have six things of water for 30 kids isn't going to go very far. So we keep that just in the container if they need to do it. Okay, training. Historically, each site has been responsible for doing its own training. And the training involves pretty much the drills that they do, the fire drills, you know, the earthquake drills, the lockdown drills. There's, it's, there you are. The training is done and procedures are conducted by sites during staff meetings and each site administrator determines the type and frequency of training. This is another area I think that the district can get more involved in. The district office staff has received training on the Emergency Operations Center, which we really haven't talked about. You could think the Emergency Operations Center is the wheel and the ICS is at the school sites or the spokes or the, or and we're the hub. So if there is a major emergency, their communications would come to us and we would gather the information so we know what's happening at the sites. So we have received some, we've received training in that and we have activated the EOC in a couple of drills and the district-wide drills we did to the earthquake drill and the lockdown drill we've done. And we'll be doing some more updated training, just a refresher course for, for district office staff in the future. And, uh, yeah, that's one area where I believe we can get more involved on a district-wide level. Additional connected efforts. This is coming from on the school, uh, on the service side. Last, uh, last year, uh, the assemb there was an assembly bill 2246, which required all middle school and higher teachers to receive training on suicide awareness and prevention. And this training will be taking place at the March 6th staff meeting for Fisher, since it only involves the middle school and higher, so they'll be receiving that training. And uh, the, a deep team from the district is going to be attending a workshop for the guidelines for responsible student threats on violence. It's being conducted by Dr. Dewey Cornell, who's a professor of education at the University of Virginia and is the director of the Virginia Youth Violence violence project and wrote the book for the guidelines for responding student threats and he'll be holding a workshop that a team from the district will be attending in May. Next steps. This is where we can improve, or in my opinion, improve it and of our team. First thing is in two days from now, uh, the Los Gas Police Department School Resource Officer uh, Kimball Stanley will be addressing the K through five 
be giving a presentation for the teachers and the district-wide collabora collaboration. We're going to update, we need to update and reassure parents on our emergency procedures. This can be done through just messaging through the LG USD Pride. It can be done, I believe, through emails um, on the district website. Just updates on what we're doing and how and think items we have in place. So a little bit better communications with the, the community and the parents. Radio checks. We do and we do regular radio checks between the district office base station and the school space station. Matter of fact, the regularly scheduled one was done this morning and it went by without any problem. But there is no set standard for the schools to test their own radios amongst the campus. Most of the schools do it. I know that um, three of the school sites have already done it this year. One is scheduled for next month. But we're going to make that a requirement every year, the 1st of August before school starts, to do radio, have every campus check every radio, get back to us right as the school year starts. If there's any problems, we can correct it, get either new radios, new batteries, get them repaired before the school year starts. There is no, currently, no district ID badge program. And uh, we think it's important that people who are affiliated with the school, whether they be school staff, district office staff, board members, if they're on a campus, should be able, people should know who we are if there's an adult walking to the campus. And this could be maintenance work, anybody. So we are uh, going to be um, securing and, uh, and uh, acquiring a, ID program, ID badge program, the equipment program, and hope to have, or not hope to have, plan on having it implemented in place at the beginning of the next school year. So when the teachers come in, they will have pictures taken in and a district issued ID badge be given to every single employee for them to, to wear for identification. Next, we're going to formalize a district-driven safety committee. Every school, the school site council has a school safety committee. We're going to have a district safety committee. The committee we plan on having is made up of at least administrators from the middle and elementary school, uh, district administration, one teacher from each site, members of classified, at least a classified staff member too, and we will invite the police and fire department. Sometimes their availability isn't as available for all meetings. I also believe that we should probably put the school nurse onto that and possibly even an outside our school insurance group risk management people to look at safety beyond just the safety things here but health issues and other safety around the, the, the school sites. Some of the things this committee can do is right now we are currently using an SB 187 which is a standardized template from the state which we're not required to do and I would believe we could create our own SB 187 with these 11 items and items that are important to the district so we have our own customized one for this district that fits our district and school's needs. Create standardized emergency training across the board for every school. You have every school have the same training, same procedures, and train the, through the same uh, standardized coordinated training. The committee would also oversee and coordinate safety, health, and accident prevention training, and on a regular basis, review, evaluate, and take action on other safety and health-related issues as required. So I would see this committee the first year meeting pretty regularly, get a lot of things placed, and then on following years, maybe uh, once every two or three months to have an update. We can explore infrastructure changes. And it's just security issues that are that can, we can every campus, every place can become more secure. We could I, some suggestions would be uh, more secure fencing, higher security fencing, electric lock, lock systems on classrooms, security cameras on the campuses. And while that is stuff that can be explored, it has to be taken into account that most of that has a pretty substantial capital investment to do. But it's items we could have on a list. Some we can like the low-hanging fruit, we might be able to get done, do it in phases. Upgrading the community communications and radio systems to connect the district office to the town. I am exploring that. I have been in contact, re meeting regularly with my, our radio supplier. I have met with the town's emergency communications coordinator, <coughs> trying to find ways to enhance. 
like I said, our system and their system, no matter, we can get the most sophisticated system for a school, but it still isn't to their standards, so we can't tie directly into their systems. But we can create something where we have a pretty secure communication system with the town. I'm also looking at the, our own communication system within the district between the school sites and the district office and at the school sites themselves. And upgrading it, I believe we had a discussion several years ago how we had our radio system was developed in the 1950s, this analog system. And uh, it's, it, it, it was archaic 20 years ago. So we have started to upgrade the digital radios. Fisher is slowly upgrading the digital radios at, that do both digital and analog. Um, and we're looking at upgrading it to a digital system between the district office and the school sites and then a digital system that will tie into the town. So we'll have more robust and secure communications between the district office and the schools, more reliable communications. I have a sort of related question and it has to do with sort of safety related communications. One of the issues is that I understand, maybe it's been resolved, but we can't dial out of the 408 district before your area code, and a lot of parents now with cell phones not changing are not on a local phone number, and it's forcing a lot of people, teachers, to actually pull out their cell phone when they need to call, or, or even, as I understand, admin staff to call parents. Is that ever being considered, evaluated? I mean, distance calls now are basically free with any phone, so I just wonder whether we have the right plan or this is a systems challenge. Well, good question, but I thought that we opened it up. Um, there was discussion last year, and I thought we opened that up to everyone to be able to dial out. But if I'm wrong, I believe that we did, but we'll check on that because there was a discussion last year on that, and I think we did. We were never told. Were you? But that was never so, a problem. Like, for some reason, 408 and 831 seemed to always be okay. We'll Is check on that. Beyond that, I'd love to know. Yeah, yeah, for sure. We'll check on that because my recollection is that we opened it up. Remind people, perhaps. Mm -hmm. I'll make sure it's beyond California because people move here from everywhere. No, open yeah. it up for it. That was the idea. Yeah. Yeah. The long distance yeah. numbers because yeah. of cell phones. So, yeah, I'll check on that. And the last thing I have on here is we're just a rel relatively easy thing. I could just found out the other day that a lot of our speaker systems in certain classrooms in certain areas they can't hear because there's like Surprise. an orchestra playing, <laughs> or um, there's they're in the NPR at lunchtime, or they're in the, the the maker lab over here. They're pounding and making a bunch of noise. Or they're just out on the playground, you can't hear the speakers. So we are going to this summer start installing loudspeakers on all the playground areas so you can hear through the playground. And on classrooms that have a higher volume of um, noise, we're going to put higher volume speakers that are louder that they can hear in these classrooms. These are the kind of things that I just find out after the fact also. That they do a drill and they find out about it. Is there any need or do new systems have like, I mean, when you think of like people who are hearing impaired, you have strobe lights off and ring, you know, the phone's ringing. I don't know whether that, you know, if you're replacing the, stuff, whether it's a simple fix or not. Well, in, fire, in the fire system, it's required. Every classroom yeah. has a strobe. And that's the main, most important main one. It's where they have the fire system. So that is, with the, that is in there. And it has, if you've been in the room, one of those things off, you leave because it's so piercing, you can't stay in. Yeah. So, so next steps, and then we're up to questions. Additional questions, yeah, Alex? Um, when we're talking about, let me bear with me for a second. Sure. When we're talking about incident training, and we're talking about how these plans are strategic but not tactical, mm -hmm. when you get to the tactical level, uh, and I apologize if I missed it, are, are school districts mandated to tactically respond in the same way? No. There is no requirement at all for school districts to even have a tactical response. And, but in this environment we live in, it just it's, it makes sense. And the way you really would want a tactical situation, and it's becoming much more apparent in this situ in our environment, is active shooter situations. And so that's why I'm asking because my daughters and I are taking a um, self-defense course, mm -hmm. and yesterday was a focus on um, 
tactical training for uh, just that kind of incident. Right. And the commentary was that, and I don't want to get too deep in the weeds, but the reason I bring it up was that the reaction and the way these schools have responded, in her opinion, is counter to the best ways to respond, meaning they're all defensive and reactive instead of proactive. Right. And many of these people have died in like a defensive mode rather than Obviously, it's securing the perimeter and all that stuff first. So it just brought up a lot of interesting things. Right. So I didn't know what your thoughts Well, were. I'm not an expert. In no, I know. I'm just saying I, I have taken an active shooter thing. course, and I sat there between a sheriff's deputy and a SWAT member, and I felt very safe. At that <laughs> <laughs> and yes, since the original training from this happened, which was this lockdown, hide stuff like that, the, the narrative has changed mm -hmm. to be one of being more proactive. And that is also on our next steps, I feel it's important, is to train staff on the current status of how to respond to active shooters. The police department has recommended some professional organizations that do this. They, don't, they themselves don't even feel that they're totally trained in doing this. And there are organizations that I feel it's, in, it's really important for us to explore. We looked at one a while back, uh, last year, that came to us from the police department, but their course was t more difficult than we did. It would require each school an eight-hour day at each school site, and it was very intense. Very thorough, but it wouldn't even scare teachers. Mm -hmm. There are other courses that we could do, possibly during a district-wide collab date, where we would bring in law enforcement professionals, the, the people that came to me were actually two retired FBI agents mm -hmm. who do this for a living, and train the staff on the tactical mo mood or tactical of active shooter at this particular time, which seems to be what they call it is a, is a, is a run, hide, defend mode and how to do that, but also to look at environments around you. Another thing that has been coming out a lot, I've been getting emails from, is things to disable the door thing so nobody can get into the room. Mm -hmm. And I've been, people have said, oh look, can we do this? That is a violation of the fire code. Yeah. We can't do that. Uh, we, some teachers have them in their rooms, and I can't, you know, I don't go search every room, we tell them they're not allowed to. It could be create a, even a worse situation by doing that. So all of, our, all of our classrooms, all of our spaces have intruder lock sets that will lock the outside of that lock. But I believe that training for complete staff training on the tactical bit of uh, the, the current training for uh, an active shooter would be a valuable. Um, yeah, so just that's just my suggestion. And this person, if you have an interest, you can let me know. She, sure. she had lovely little um, teacher arrangements. She's like, every teacher could have this on their desk. And then she broke it apart how it was like, they were all like lethal weapons, <laughs> <laughs> but, but all like all like innocuous, so there weren't something that you could get in trouble for theoretically having in your classroom. It wasn't like there was like a gun in a flower pot. So it was, um, but it was really interesting. And she um, she trained CIA bodyguards, so the woman is more than qualified. Okay. To, uh, well, yeah. Give me so that, just yeah, reach out to me if you sure. want. I, I just I was thinking that it, what she taught made so much sense, right? like logical sense and easy for people to do without having to go to like firearms training and mm -hmm. things like that. So anyway, yes. so we can talk about that offline. Right. What issues cause the most injuries at sort of district-wide? Is there a, any themes or things? I mean, you know, sort of the getting away from the once in a blue moon horrific event, whether it's earthquake or a active shoot, but there's also sort of often, oh, certain things where kids are just always falling or when certain children just act out, be, and we could address training on how to manage uh, the guy working out in the locker next to me, he deals with a lot of special needs kids, and you know, he's watched teachers who aren't trained in how to deal with it, and they're forced into the like over sort of dealing. All of a sudden, it's kind of like when you see police come in, it's like ah, as opposed to just diffusing it. And so, are we addressing? the common everyday problems or safety aspects as opposed to what SB 187 says, oh, you got to be prepared for the well, ones in a moonshot. And that's where we could address that in the district safety committee. And that's where we're bringing in, our, say, our insurance group risk manager who gets the reports 
from the, the injuries that we have. Where Perfect. where there, school nurse, nurse where are the most yeah. things happening, and then we could just it may be uh, just we find out that the surface under our playground equipment isn't the could be addressed right. or the equipment itself. We actually. Um, Lauren, did, we had to do this at Lexington right after they opened it. We had to remove a few items from their playground equipment because the kids were spinning themselves right off into, <laughs> into the next atmosphere. <laughs> so sometimes you find out about it like that. So, but that's where a safety committee could explore situations like that. Perfect. That's awesome. That committee sounds like a great idea. Okay. Steve, John? I, got, I have a couple of things. Sure. The, um, Good presentation, by the way. I'm glad to, uh, glad to see the detail that was in there. You have four grab-and-go binders well, uh, with the police department. Yes, we have four grab-and-go binders. We also have one that we're still trying. The Lexington School is not in the city. Okay. And so I have a binder. I have a binder sitting in my office. Who gets that one? The sheriff's, the sheriff's department, but we don't really know who to give it to because they we don't have an SRO to deal with. So but they have a... They have a police officer, albeit maybe it's a sheriff's officer that's assigned to Lexington, correct? I'm not. No? Not, no, not necessarily. When we call um, each year, we have a sheriff's office that comes in and does the assessment. Who do you call? The sheriff's office. Okay. And then. Um, I see that as something that we need yeah. to explore but, a little but, deeper. On that point, isn't it true? I mean, if a real incident. You know, LGPD is going to be rushing up there too if there's a right. violence. Okay. That Actually, I don't think so. Actually, they didn't they didn't years ago, we, we were we were basically yeah, told that if there is an, an active shooter, the first responder is the highway patrol. They yeah, that's correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so they would be up there the fastest. So, unfortunately, Lexington they have Santa Clara County Fire, so we have that continuity, but there. I, I will be honest with you that we don't have, I have a very good relationship with the police department and I have never met the sheriff's deputy for Lexington. Good. And do you know, is this sort of a systemic issue with the sheriff's department and schools mm -hmm. in unincorporated areas? I, I mean, do they have better relationships? Well, they got Lakeside and CT English that are, yeah, it must no, be in the same situation. Right, yeah. We could find out, I'm not sure, I know that in Saratoga they are the the contract police department for Saratoga, so they have an SRO in the Saratoga School District that deals with them. But in the, the unincorporated areas, they I, were great when they finally arrived. <laughs> sheriff, or what? Yeah. The sheriff really it took like, Yeah, time. so uh, and that seems like something we should try to get covered. I mean, I get the highway patrol, but it seems, but it's really sheriff. The sheriff is the first point of contact. The sheriff's first point of contact. Yeah. That the, we didn't the, have, I mean, that I could see anyone during the actual lockdown. Um, it wasn't until the lockdown was lifted. 30 that, minutes? That, um, Typically, the, the sheriff's off the road. It really wasn't, uh, oh, it someone on. wasn't really working with me until I was working on student release. Hmm. Well, I think that's an issue we need to. Can we with the LGPD? I mean, because... Oh, really? I mean, I, I understand what they're saying, but if we actually had an active shooter there to say, oh, they showed up three hours later, great, you know. And, and I mean, that's just unacceptable. Honestly, I couldn't see what was happening outside because I had all the blinds. Yeah, yeah. yeah, but um, we had telephone contact. Okay. Yeah. And then, of course, I was in contact with the district office who was in contact with folks yeah. also, so it wasn't like no one was in contact with <coughs> But you had them physically there. Being a resident in that area, if there's any issues, we got the sheriff's our our hotline mm -hmm. yeah. to go yeah, to. Right. Yeah. And then CHP was working out there because of road conditions. Yeah, sure. Okay, next comment. I think your future initiative slide is is very good, and uh, some of that stuff could be pricey, but maybe working with uh, IT, we could find some pilot programs. I know we have some pretty valuable equipment in the media rooms. And computer rooms, and uh, uh, maybe we could try electronic locks there. Maybe we could try do a pilot program on some cameras, just at strategic locations. I would, I think you would not hear any argument from any of the principals at the school site to do that. We'd like to. Fisher has been. We've been trying to get something off the ground for the last year. We actually have prices and quotes to do it, uh, just in the general quad area, or as we like to call it, the. Town of Los Gatos Skate Park. Um, 
Yeah, it had to be phases, but a pilot's a good way to yeah, break, break also into that technology. Also, some potential, if we had, uh, there are potential grants out there. If we, if we have a grant, somebody can, 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 can have the ability to write a grant, there is possible money there for both radios, emergency communications, and for, for cameras. And when you're talking about ID badges, you may have some that are have car key readable. So if they you are, get those yeah. things, you're able to go and know who goes into it, uh, would, when they go in. I had mentioned in the past, or have, have brought up prior, uh, to do a pilot program on certain areas where we have uh, common locks that we can do it. Uh, put one on the gym, for example, and we could, for control from outside groups that are using mm -hmm. it, put uh, electronic locks on the staff rooms. So we, if a teacher, right now, if a teacher were to lose their key, we would have to, we've had, we've had to relock, do relocking here, it would just be a badge that you would have to. I don't even want to ask how and the a keys lot are of, A lot of districts have done that, you yeah. know, um, where you start with the name badge and then the badge becomes the key and the key then, so if somebody loses their badge, you know, it's very easy, you know, to get a new badge, right. that one's yeah. I, I, taken care of. I, I meet regularly with my counterparts at the other school districts, the other directors in the Valley, and the basic consensus I'm getting is that if they're doing some new construction, they're going that route, but it is almost prohibitively expensive to do, do it, the retrofit schools mm -hmm. with it. And basic I don't think you can br brush it across the whole district. Because but I think if it's a not, if it's right now, the technology is not there for a wireless system to have real-time locking of the, the facilities. That's, that's the biggest concern. A hardwired system, you can send a signal out and the door will lock immediately, but on a wireless system, there could be as much as a 20 to 30 second delay. And if there's an active shooter on a campus, 20 to 30 seconds is, is unacceptable. So. Okay, I, I think it's a, a good idea to keep on the radar and look for an opportunity to break into some pilots in some areas on both of those things. Technology advancement, it's always good to well, get your feet wet. And it's technology and it's an advancement. We have we have technology we put in our schools and we build schools that are were obsolete two years after they put them in. So yeah. you know. Okay, thank okay. you. We're moving us on to public comment, if that's okay. Uh, we have a card from Diana Hill. Time's up. First of all, I want to say thank you for um, agendizing this. You could tell that our last meeting that we were wanting to talk about it. Um, a lot of the questions I provided an email to you all in the conversation with Marl, it seems like you've been able to answer, Neil. Um, I do wonder, though, who is the expert? So if we don't have a resident expert on this topic, who would be that expert? I know there was a consultant that we had come talk to staff couple years ago um, so I'd just be interested in that like who who locally is the expert on school safety and could we tap them a little bit I know that at different school sites they have kind of content experts Stephanie Young's husband is a fire chief in Santa Cruz and we've got John Lux with the Blossom Hill all kinds of stuff um, so of course on a sad note we do have monthly fire drills but as you know when was the last time a student died in a fire so we're practicing for fire drills, but we are not practicing for, unfortunately, what is much more common. And to think that we're immune to this is really negligence on our part. I'd hate to think of it happening, but in reality, it, it is happening. And um, I do not feel prepared. I feel more prepared to deal with child abuse than I do for gun violence um, because we're mandated, right? And I have to sit through those videos every year. Exactly. The principal makes sure, watches every video, answer all the questions. Well, the teacher, um, but I don't, know, I don't know the tactical plan. I did t take self-defense when I was in high school and in college, um, but I was just talking to somebody the other day, and I was looking at my room, like, what would I grab? Fire extinguisher. I'm going to grab the fire extinguisher, right? <laughs> like, what do I have to protect my kids? Little on me. Um, so I would like to know, um, you know, has an audit been conducted at each school site? That was my request. Did we get somebody to come onto every school campus and just eyeball it and say, are the doors being locked? Are the doors functioning? I can't get into Fisher, even though I try. It is definitely locked down. Um, so I would like that. I would like to know, um, are those procedures that are stated being followed? So whatever those procedures are, are they being followed? The badging process. Parents walk in. Are they still just able to grab a visitor's pass and stick it on? If I don't know who Peter Neumer is, I should be asking you, who are you? Why are you on my campus? Um, and then Lauren brought up Lexington. I thought about you guys. Like, you, you went through that. So what were the lessons learned at Lexington? And 
I'm sure Lauren's already implementing things, but what could be applied to other school sites? Right, so there's, there's stuff that are outside our realm of control, but then what's our plan B? Um, do the doors lock from the inside, or do I have to leave my classroom to lock my classroom door? And I know that's maybe cost prohibitive, but let's plan for that. What are we gonna do in the event that we have to leave our classroom to lock our door for safety? Um, I need to know, I need my students to know. So um, what are the names of the exits? If I can tell my fifth graders go to N2, Nino 2, they know exactly what exit that is because the shooter or the bad person or the dog or whatever is at um, Los Gatos 3. So things like that. Some, there's an expert out there who will tell us that. Um, I got a brand new radio, thank you, Neil, for replacing the battery on my radio. Um, so radio checks are essential. I need to be able to be in communication with my office and um, teachers aren't going to necessarily check those radios, so it's helpful for administrators to just say, hey, check your radio, John, and leave it on all day. Turn four. At the end of the day, do that radio check, because I have my radio. I take it out to PE all the time. I thought it was fully functional. When I had a student who had a medical need and I was required to then carry that radio all the time, I realized this radio wasn't working. <laughs> There's um, nothing automatic on those radios to tell you to replace the batteries, huh? No. My remote... A, just life experience, John. Um, and then the radios don't connect, obviously, with the district office. So if, if I need to get a hold of the district office, I have to do the relay system. And then I think there's constant battles between who's on what system, so even the fire department, the police station. So communications is an issue all around. It's not just us. Um, just a simple thing also. If we're actually stuck in the building, Lauren, I don't know what you do for toilets. <laughs> so when the, when if we actually are uh, told to stay because there's toxic fumes or whatever, uh, we don't have that five gallon bucket that my other school sites have had. Home Depot bucket works great. Um, so do we say code red, or do we say there's a shooter on campus? So every staff needs to know what is the language, what's the jargon, what are we what are we supposed to say? Um, I know that drills are being conducted because I'm a teacher and I see them happening, but we aren't always evacuated at all school sites, so they can say, yes, we did the drill, but students aren't practicing that whole process, and I think it's important for them to understand the importance of safety and trusted adults and process, all that good stuff. Um, are there regular trainings and conversations happening at school sites? I know some school sites have a very heightened awareness around school safety, whereas others just check <coughs> took, took care of that. Um, Fred taught me about this application called Say Something. It's a little phone app. It's from the Sandy Hook Promise um, website where you can report if you, if you know of somebody or you suspect something uh, that might not be quite right in, in a community. So it's help us to like, anonymously report things. Um, so i would be interested to know kind of what can we do to create more of an inclusive and nurturing community. And then also let's not have that person, that adult or that kid, go pass through those experiences and not be reported properly. Glad to hear we're going to have some badges. As much as I hate to have to wear a badge, I think it's important. Um, and I'm, I'm thankful that we have the SRO coming to talk to us on the 14th, but I hope that they're not going to stand and deliver for an hour. I really feel like we need to have school site conversations. So if we can't do it at that meeting, it would be great to have those actual tactical conversations um, by our site admin. I, I don't know of any school principal who actually has addressed their staff regarding the school shooting that happened over a month ago. And that, to me, um, is probably uncomfortable for them to even bring up. But imagine what it's like for us as teachers to be in the classroom and not have had that conversation. So thank you, Marla, and thank you, RCF, for at least having that conversation on the 14th. Thanks. Uh, Teresa Bonner. Dave's Avenue School, um, and I wrote it out so I could try to remember what I wanted to say. Um, I'm here tonight to speak out for student and staff safety at our schools, in particular Dave's Avenue where I teach. Dave's Avenue is not a secure campus. Many of our gates are scalable, meaning that kids and adults can climb them, and they do. And some of the mechanisms catch so the gates to the parking lot do not latch. This leaves the students and staff vulnerable. I personally have found the door to our staff room propped open both during and after school hours. This door leads directly out to the parking lot. The large gate behind the multi-use room is often left wide open. This provides direct access to the campus by both pedestrians and motor vehicles. First and foremost is student safety, but following closely should be staff safety. Many of us find that we need to extend our hours to finish our professional obligations. This means that we are on campus before 7 a.m. and after 4 p.m. 
At times it may, be, may mean being on campus on the weekends or holidays. We need gates that keep non-employees out of the areas we work. Our office has a panic button um, that I was told was installed and is a direct link to the police department. However, it has never been tested and requests to test the button have been met with silence. We need to test these buttons to make sure they work. Visitors to campus are not always required to sign in. This is especially problematic when we have performances on campus and there are a large number of visitors. It would be way too easy for someone to enter campus at that time for reasons other than seeing the performance. It may not be someone with a gun, but it could be a non-custodial parent or someone intent on stealing items from classrooms. We have a need for district identification, which, thank you, I heard that that was something we're looking at. Um, we need to know that those people on campus are supposed to be there and who they are. Furthermore, more drills and trainings need to take place. There is a clear lack of training. I know that I do not feel adequately prepared for a natural or man-made disaster, let alone an act like has recently taken place in Florida. Besides all that I have listed, what can we do as a district to provide counseling support for those students who need it? At this time, the only way to get counseling for a student is if their issue is affecting their academics. What about the child that doesn't fit in? What about the sad child? What about the child we all worry about because something just doesn't seem right? These are the students we need to support in the primary years. I know the middle school has beefed up their counseling, but we are sorely lacking in resources in the primary and the elementary school. We need safe campuses, but we also need to find ways to prevent future problems. I implore you to visit our campuses on a routine basis and provide your ideas to secure our schools for the safety of our students and staff. And that, I wrote a couple notes just listening to the, um, I was really surprised to hear that it has just recently become, um, the districts become aware that the intercoms can't be heard and the bells can't be heard. I was told by site administration this had been reported and that nothing's being done. So I was a little bit surprised by that. It is really impossible, depending on where you are on campus, to hear anything. If you're in a restroom in the office, you don't hear intercom, you don't hear bells, you hear nothing. Um, we do have an updated strategic emergency plan, but it has not been shared with our site. I found it because I came to the board meeting and it was in the agenda. Um, it has updated positions, but teachers have not been apprised of those positions. Our backpacks that we have in our classrooms have not been updated with this current year's students. So there is no information on my backpack. I will be making sure I print those tomorrow when I get to school, but no one's been directed to do that. Um, and I guess I leave you with, we've been talking about the price of these things. What price do we put on safety? What price do we put on these things? Thank you. Mary? Mary, you're up. Dave's keeping over a little safety conscious right now. <laughs> we talk a little bit. Um, thank you for your time. I want to add on to what Teresa said and what Diana Hill said about safety concerns. Also, in keeping what, with Alex Potts brought up about making proactive moves, I think that's where we're the teachers and staff are usually coming from. Like, why aren't we doing these things ahead of time? I don't want to be in a position where I'm having to tell my kids, throw all the scissors, throw all the scissors. I want to avoid any of that. Um, at our site, there's no protocol for staff being aware of, I'm going to take a breath. Oh, I get too excited. Um, of being too aware of the sometimes, like this year, numerous restraining orders we have on file for children on our campus, for adults to be away from them. Um, if we're to be one of the main advocates for the safety of our students, we need to be made aware of the identities of the people who are not allowed to interact with our students. This shouldn't just be the child's teacher, but instead the huge network of people that take care of our kids, frontline staff, other grade level teachers, other educators on campus, like psychologists, speech therapists, people who are on campus, um, should be brought on board. We ought to be trusted with this private information, just like we're entrusted with the lives of our kids each day. Um, Teresa brought up the name tag thing. We don't have people check in all the time, especially for performances, and I had that happen. I had a person who was um, in jail for attempted murder. I was the only person allowed to see that person's picture. They showed up at the graduation, they'd gotten out of jail, and everybody was let in. I shudder to think, I mean, everything worked out fine, but I wanted more people to be aware of what that person looked like. <coughs> um, it's great that we're a community school. 
We are open after hours and on the weekend for baseball and all kinds of things. I think we need maybe a staff member, again, Price, to patrol the grounds each morning, especially on Mondays. Right now, it's mostly Teresa. Um, and ensure <laughs> that any items left over on the weekend around our field and our campus, this is also one of those small safety things that we talk about. Um, I have personally found marijuana. Um, we have found lighters, glass bottles, alcohol and otherwise, um, condoms, lots of dog poop, and other items that elementary school age kids should not be picking up a bag of weed and going, this is weird. What is this? Right? So I'd really like to see us have some investment in that safety thing. I know maybe one site has that person who walks around, make sure the gates are closed, staff and students are safe, all the community members that are supposed to be there are there, all the ones that are not supposed to be there won't be there. Um, regarding the emergency plans, I'm hoping other sites are following these protocols. I was surprised, like Teresa, to hear some of the things that were in the outline of the command systems. Um, we, we looked it up really quickly and I went, oh, my role has changed in three years. I am now in charge of documentation when before I was part of search and rescue. Mm. Oh, okay. Guess I'll figure that out when the time comes. Um, I didn't know what to do. I don't know how to do that role. I don't know what that's about. Um, there just doesn't seem to be a streamlined approach or a centered approach to the protocols. So I would feel better if the district was confirming all the equipment was in walk working order, like we talked about walkie-talkie checks, make sure the backpacks are reviewed each year. Um, new hires, guys. <laughs> new hires at the site. I don't know if it's just left up to individual site admins, but new hires may not know. Look through your backpack, check it out, know what you have. Certain things um, just don't seem to be making it to new hires as well. Um, and about Mr. Kunzman's comment about a pilot program with the tech, I love that idea, trying some things out. I'd also like just to consider those connections with the county that we have. I know Santa Clara County has a lot of resources. I don't know how much we can tap into about getting an expert that we talked about, a safety expert, something like that, and bring the county in to help us out. Just thought I'd throw that out. Maybe that's something the new safety committee could look into. So. Thank you. Sorry for my shaky voice. I'm very you. passionate about the safety. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So, a lot to think about. Yeah. For all of us. Yeah. Yeah. Back to the principles, too. Yeah. 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 Have you ever evaluated, like, having a check-in process? And I, I don't mean just the visitor badge. I mean, I know in Illinois. Sign in. It's actually required that any volunteer on campus has to actually have a fingerprint. In a lot of schools, you take a picture of, you know, the picture of the person. You wear like a little badge or you know a, a sticker. I mean, I just don't know. Were there any schools in this? I just visited this a school in Florida. They ran my driver's license mm -hmm. in, in the office, and then issued me a badge. Speaking of safety, is there any, do we even verify that people have valid driver's licenses? I mean, do you that? You mean that when they're driving on field trips? For field trips, yeah. Oh, yes, we do do that. <laughs> we do? For sure. Yeah, yeah. you have to provide proof, yeah. Yeah. proof of yeah. insurance, There's too. And proof of insurance. But can we check it? I mean, they, they yes. fill it out. We, we yes. call USAA sure. to yes. see yes. if I have insurance yeah. That, I think, we do a pretty good job with. Um, so I, if I may I appreciate really these comments and I hope that from those we can kind of have a running list of, I mean, we could, if this is more broad scope, it's awesome. I think the community is great, but certainly I would love to, if we can take these kinds of comments and, uh, you know, as an example, just like the propping open doors and then we've addressed that in each campus and take some of those little things, like, I, you know, to Sharice's point, it's not going to cost us an arm and a leg and just make sure we don't prop open doors. But just to kind of have some follow up and circle back to that, I would you know, need another presentation from it, but just to know that it's kind of on the radar to start going through that. And I, I don't know who, like if that's Neil or Veronica can do that. Well, I mean, it sounds like it, it may be worth an update either before or around the end of the year. Just, I mean, not like this, but just a little, here's some new things that we've done. We're, we're it's kind of like the low-hanging fruit thing, yeah. right? Yeah. And right. the committee's going to talk about the bigger aspects, but some of these low-hanging fruit items would be great to see them checked off. 
Yeah, and even at the principals meeting, finding out from the principals, you know, here are some things that came up. You know, what's happening on your site? Right. You know, and a site might have something. Oh, we do it like this, and and it's helpful. I mean, you've got a lot of people sharing ideas. You know, and a lot of it has sure, to be no, site driven. Right. You know, right. like a door sure. propped open that's the outside. Sure. You know, I mean, I, I I will drive by the back side of Fisher and the back door to the music room will be open. Mm -hmm. I mean, I call Paul Brennan and said they got it propped open, but they go and close it, but three days later, it's propped open. You know, so it has to be, uh, education has to come from the sites, too. Yeah, sure. Sure. The door being propped open. I did report that, and it was kind of dismissed that it was a custodian letting the floors dry. But this was like at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. So I don't know. Well, so that, that just proves why the education goes to all yeah. members of the district and not just the members. Well, I think an update yeah. before the end of yeah, the year. Yeah, major change probably, right? Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Nick. Thanks, Scott. Yeah. No, do it around two. We'll talk about some Fisher Field stuff. Yeah, you're, you're not <laughs> off the hook yet. To the update in June. So we all know what a D zone is, right? Yes. <laughs> Back in, uh, well, let's uh, get, talk about D zone. We'll do our little agenda here. We'll review what we talked about November 13th, what our current budget status is, the D zone costs, and talk about what the options are going forward. So, Back in November, if you recall, you approved the, the plan. And it was discussed at that time. John had actually brought it up, and we said we would revisit the D zone once that time has come. And basically, that time has come. The, uh, the actually, uh, last Friday, they started the curbs have been poured for the, the, the track. The outside curbs are being done now, or being formed. Hopefully the rains will let them do that soon. Uh, they are planning on having the track graded and uh, all the asphalt down by the end of this month. And then right about the middle, toward the end of uh, April, it would be synthetic surface will be going down on the track. The company, Bainon, needed a two-week notice before they started to get materials and everything set up to uh, do that, which is the 12th of April. Uh, this is the last board meeting before that, so we're going to have to decide uh, how we're going to proceed with the defense. So, to re recap, the D zone, one, the, the west D zone was approved in the original scope. We added the east D zone, and they were going to explore costs at this point about putting synthetic surface on the west side D zone only at that time. Here's the current budget as of today. We started with a contingency fund of $195,000. So far, we have spent $118,280 and actually 35 cents or something like that, but I rounded down. That includes the lime treatment, all of the underground work you had to do with the, the, the um, water lines and such. Also put into the budget was $40,000 for special inspections for special concrete. This job doesn't require any special concrete, so it won't require those inspections. And we have a $10,000 allowance for electrical, but no electrical is planned for the project. There may be a little bit needed for inspections for a regular inspector. Since the project is going, he's paid basically for each week he works. And since the project has gone on about an additional four weeks, and that would be about Five or six thousand dollars over, but on, on another one of his budgets, he's actually up slightly under budget. So, as of now, we have a potential available funds of about one hundred and twenty-six thousand seven hundred twenty. And I would I would lower round that down to about one hundred twenty thousand if you want to put in that expect uh, expect inspection fund. D zone costs. Bainon uh, submitted, Bainon is the company that does the synthetic turf, and they, I received a ch potential change order from them um, last week, and they said the cost for a, a D AD zone would be $27,000. The initial 
estimate was $31,050, so it's $4,000 less per zone than the original estimate. So now we have some options. Option one is we just keep the project the way it is to asphalt D zones and don't make any changes at all. We can add a D zone surfacing to the west side where the long jump pits are at 27000 that would leave a contingency of about $49,000, dollars That doesn't include that forty or 1000 and 10000 inspection. That's just strictly what we have in the current contingency fund. If we were to add synthetic... Wait, can you say that part again? I'm sorry. Okay, that does... The 49720 does not count that other extra 40,000 inspection or 50, 10,000 there. That would be added to that if you... It would be added to that. Needed. Just the... Right. If we were to do both surfaces, both D zones, it's 54,000, we would have 22,720 left in the, the fund. We don't have to make this decision until the final decision until April 12th. I spoke to all of the con all of our prime contractors within the last week, adding, seeing where they stand in the project. The only potential change there might be is the earthworks may have to haul off a small amount of excess topsoil if they have too much from the field. By the time April 12th rolls around and the schedule we stay pretty much on schedule, all the earthwork will be done, all the topsoil will be back on the field. The only thing that will left to be done is the synthetic track and putting in slit irrigate, slit drainage, and the sod. They are not predicting any more need for any change orders at all, or if they are, they'll need minor little change orders for irrigation. So a $22,000, 22000 contingency should be sufficient to see the rest of the project too if you wanted to do both D zones. 50,000 would be more than enough in my mind, but we don't need to real, we can make a motion if you were to do <coughs> these zones to say based, based upon the contingency fund at that April 12th time, we could just, we could see if we're going to do one, both, or, or neither. That's a discussion for you to have. So that's where we stand on the project. Excuse me. We need to decide so we to can procrastinate a little while. We we can we. Uh, well, we can wait until March 26. That would be the last date. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We that can. would be the last date. Yeah. Can I ask a clarifying question? Sure. So we're talking about both basically the two long jumps, right? And then the high jump area in the other D zone potentially. Potentially. And we're talking about actually synthetic track for the whole D zone, not just the runways. The whole D zone. Okay. On both sides, both these ones would be completely synthetic. Okay. Yeah. I think it's a great idea. I think we should close this loop. We talked about it when we were originally doing it. I was a strong advocate because this is something that wouldn't be fifty-four thousand dollars later. It would be a ton a of money. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it's a safety consideration too. Well, and it, it gives an area for the high jump, yeah. you know, as opposed to having to put that somewhere else. And so, sir, you're saying do both, or just do the yeah, one? do them both. Yeah. Do both. Make a motion. I move that we approve. Hang on. Nope. Wait, wait. Okay. I mean, let's, <laughs> leave, let's make sure. Let's you make said sure. make a motion. I, I, I know. So We're trying to be efficient. Let's just make sure. Uh, and we've got to do, we have to have public comment. Right? I have no cards, but. So, but I also just want to make sure, are there any other board questions, comments, clarifying, whatever? None for me. Not as, not as long as we think we have enough left for the foreseeable contingency things. Right. And based upon what we're looking at with those inspection amounts, I mean, we do not need special inspections, so we know that won't be. And in talking with my inspector last week, he feels that if he needs any more, it may be at the most $10,000 or that $40,000. So we'd have 30000 there. There is no electrical plan for this project, so that's ten thousand. So we have forty thousand extra dollars actually there that we could add to that contingency fund. Okay. So. And I've also uh, framed this to Kramer also. Sure. And they 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 agree with those numbers. Public comment. We don't have any cards. Okay. Now, if someone <laughs> wants to make a motion. I'm okay. Sorry. <laughs> 
Your turn, Dick. Okay, <laughs> I, I make a like motion that we approve putting the synthetic surface in the bulk D zone at $27,000 per. Or approve the change order for bulk D zone synthetic surface. Change order. Thank you. Is that it now, Neil? It's my wife's birthday, so I'm going to go home. All right. Oh. Enjoy. <laughs> Did you see that last meeting? No. <laughs> 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 that was the other one. <laughs> my dog ate me home with right? Uh, okay, so Terry, you guys are up, right? Get us back on schedule. <laughs> uh, I'm so not good at that. <laughs> I will try to, um, through slide, you know, some of these slides are the same, you know, that we went through, a little bit educational, and we discussed them last week, so I, I will try to go through them a little bit more um, quickly this time. So again, um, just a couple of minutes on the state budget process. We definitely need to talk about the key assumptions in second interim, because certain, um, certain of them have, have certainly changed. Um, you know, we'll talk about uh, the state funding and our funding and how those are um, interacting, which may be a little bit more than they usually do. Um, look at the budget, the MYP, keep stirs and purrs in front of you, as painful as that is, um, and then and talk about where we go from here. So um, again, kind of move the arrow, where are we now? Um, obviously the governor's budget uh, has, has come out. Not a lot of um, information as it relates to us just because we're not state funded, we're community funded. However, the governor did propose um, a, a pretty good chunk of one time money, and I'll talk about it later. Um, but the way the number was derived, it was $295 per ADA, and the, and the number came um, because there was that much left in the state budget. Nobody, and you know, he's the education governor, so it was like divide by ADA, and that's what it equals, but that's before anybody else comes to the table, right? Prisons and healthcare and everybody else. So I think everybody's feeling is that's the most it's going to be. Last week, the discussion was, well, all the schools are clamoring, all the school districts are clamoring that they really need an increase in their LCFF-based funding. If they take that pot of money and they put it on base funding, that's really good for like 90% of our clients, but um, not so much for basic A districts, then we wouldn't even see it at all. So it is not in next year's numbers that we're going to go over, just so you know, that there's really a lot of tentative, um, uh, you know, there's really no understanding where we're going to end up on that at this point. So ledger analyst has weighed in, uh, likes the plans that the governor's come up with, which is always a good thing, and um, we're just kind of waiting to see how, how cash comes in the next couple of months, what, you know, what taxes are looking like in April, and then, of course, we'll we'll update the budget at kind of at the last minute based on May revise and what, uh, what, what's happening at the, at the state level. So the second interim, as you know, kind of our quarterly report as of January 31st, um, it projects actual um, activity for the current year through June 30th, but um, year to date activity just through January 31. Um, there's a detailed budget, there's multi-year projections, there's a cash flow projection, those are all required components per AB 1200, and we, um, we always, the, the board then must certify as to either our, our status being either positive qualified or negative. Positive being we will absolutely be able to meet our current and future obligations for the next two years, or qualified we may or may not be able to, but we're going to be talking positive tonight, which is a beautiful thing. So assumptions of the current year budget, I'm um, not really talking about MYP here yet. Um, we have uh, property taxes in the current year estimated to be 26.7 million. They always fluctuate a little bit at the end of the year. We kind of get the, we're supposed to get the last 5% at the end of June and sometimes maybe it's four and a half, maybe it's five and a half, but um, that's our estimate right now. We're running about five and a half percent increase over the prior year. Lottery estimated to remain, you know, they kind of, they've had the same consistent uh, projection for the last few years, 146 for our, you know, the original lottery funds, the unrestricted dollars, and then $48 for the Prop 20 restricted lottery money. Um, it's always, that's always a wrong number, right? But we never know what our lottery for our current year is until we get that final allocation in October of the following year. 
and the actual we get the money after our books are closed and you see your unaudited actuals. So even when we get to the end of the year and close our books, we're wrong. It's always something different. It always flushes out in the current year. Um, the mandated cost block grant um, is something that you know for which we're eligible. Thirty dollars per ADA for an elementary district. In the current year budget, we have the one-time dollars to be used for mandated cost reimbursement on paper anyway for $147. It's about $464,000 for us. Um, we have in each of the years, and, and including the current year, the scheduled increases in stirs and PERS, and I have more on that later. And then, of course, we have our parcel tax, which is coming in at about two and three quarter million dollars, and foundation contribution is budgeted at $500,000. Um, ADA, we're down a little bit, which as a community funded district is, is okay, not something that we get um, exercised about um, as it doesn't uh, drive our primary funding sources. On um, the expenditure side, of course, we have all of the salaries and benefits have been updated. Um, we, we do that actually at first interim, right, as we, as we balance our vacancies and the positions that we've ended up hiring and any turnover that we have against the budget. We're using everything is based on the current years um, or prior years, P2 average daily attendance. The, you know, you're always funded on the higher of, of current year or prior, and that affects the lottery, the one time dollars. That's what we care um, about ADA the most. The increased stores and purse costs are in there. And then the EPA account um, is to be used, you know, no administrative costs, teaching, teaching costs only. And so we could pretty much teach your salaries and benefits to that funding source, and I think I mentioned last time, for non-basic agents, this is actually a benefit to basic aid districts, one of the very few we get from the state. In um, LCFF funded districts, there's this like, oh yeah, we, we passed Prop 30, and look at all this money for schools, and what they said is, here's your LCFF chunk, we're gonna call this amount Prop 30, and you have to track it separately and spend it separately, and it's not an additional dollar. For basic aid districts, we do get $200 per ADA um, on top of all of our other state funds. And so, um, and then that it was supposed to have expired, but it got extended. So that is um, a nice source of state funding that um, we, you know, we hadn't expected a few years ago and are enjoying. So that, so we're getting about 632,000 on top of um, our flat state aid portion and our property taxes, which have been increasing. So there's our total general fund um, revenue. Um, the biggest change since first interim is that we've now um, received the final appropriation for the Prop 39 energy money, and that's about $533,000. Um, we had to finish submitting all of the last of our plans, and I mean, there's, it's very tightly controlled as far as once you submit this, then the monies will start flowing. We have several districts that have been so slow in submitting things that they're just now getting some of their first um, apportionments there, but we actually have been on, on track all along and received our last um, um, apportionment. And so there's 533,000 in state revenue that we added, but then there's also 533,000 of expenditures. We may or may not spend it all this year, but we wanted to put it in there in a balanced way, and of course it'll carry over because it's high, it's very restrictive money. Um, so just a um, you know graphical representation of revenue in uh, the general fund. This is just general fund only, but it is combined, restricted and unrestricted, <coughs> with the big chunk being our general purpose, which is um, primarily property taxes, a little sliver of federal revenue, which of course, it's tied to our unduplicated pupil count, which is quite low. Um, the state revenue, uh, which went up a little bit of a chunk, right, for the energy money. Local revenue, and that's where our property or our parcel tax sits. So that's why that's a, a much bigger uh, slice of the pie than you would see in many districts. And then other financial sources, local local funds or uh, or um, uh, transfers in that sort of thing. So general fund expenditures, and again, general fund, no cafeteria, no facilities, um, you know, those things that we track in a restricted manner outside of our general operating fund. Um, on the um, uh, unrestricted side, employee costs are running about 88% of the budget. It's much lower when you look, when you throw in the restricted side because many of our special ed costs are contracted services. They're not our employees. They're somebody else's employees, whether it's the county, uh, the county office or the SELPA or um, a non-public school, 
And so because we track those in what we call the 5,000s, right, the other services and operations and not part of certificated or classified salaries, it throws that formula off, but doesn't mean that we're not serving those kids with people. Um, but it, it just, it, it makes it kind of a funny, funny ratio. But um, so just unrestricted and then the combined is throwing in the restricted costs as well. I'm like the self, what percentage of that other services is, is functionally like services we would be educating our kids if we did it in-house? Right. Um, this comes up, people yeah. often think that is like overhead or they don't exactly. understand other services or educational yeah. services. Or and that's something, we'll bring that back to you. Um, I mean, I love that you ask and, um, and, and bring that up because... 5,000, I mean, everything's kind of really obvious, right? The, we've got certificated, classified, employee benefits. Employee benefits is even one that folks don't realize. That's not just your health care, right? I mean, health, de dental, vision, unemployment, workers' comp, things that employees might not think, really, you're spending that on my behalf. Statutorily, think Social Security, Medicare, STRS, PERS, all of that's in those 3,000 employee benefits. But, yeah, the 5,000s are pretty much everything else that we, you know, that isn't a book or... Um, and so it includes utilities, it includes insurance, it includes all of those non-public schools and agencies. Those things right there are going to be the majority of your 5,000s, and those aren't like nasty consultants or something like that, right? Um, and many times they're not things over which we even have any control. You know, we get told, um, uh, you know, from, from the JPA, for instance, okay, here's what your insurance premium is going to be next year, and it's based on your facilities and the age of your facilities, right? And, and what your loss ratios are and yeah. things. So, yeah, we can bring you that list, though, and kind of divide it into areas that make sense to people that they're just like, oh, yeah, so, so this is like my whole household budget, <laughs> um, and, and you've all got it in, in this line five. It's, it's uh, or the 5,000s. It's not necessarily bad things. But I, I appreciate the question. We'll get you an answer. Thanks. Professional development, bring in a speaker. That might be in a 5,000 as well. Um, so again, here's a budget summary breaking down the unrestricted and the restricted. Unrestricted, um, it's your LCFF funding, which for us is mostly property taxes, the original lottery, any one-time mandate cost dollars, those are all in unrestricted. Restricted is you know, your federal program, special ed, even though every additional dollar of special ed has an unrestricted impact because it's not fully funded, we track it in that restricted column. Um, Prop 20 lottery dollars, the California Energy Funds, those are all in the restricted column. So here's the changes since first interim. Um, and so a couple of little revenue changes, but contributions to restricted programs went up noticeably. Um, about $100,000 of that is legal costs that we're incurring. And you know what, and those are just so hard to predict. Some years you're going to have a lot of special ed legal and others you're not. You're more familiar with that than, you know, and, and what's actually going on there than we are likely. But those costs have been going up and we had to increase the contribution for that. And then there's some additional, um, there's some additional salaries in there that were not in there before and some additional like non-public contracts. And you add those as you need those. It's very, you know, you, you do what you have to do there. So we just track that and we have to plug that gap. Here's our special ed funding. Here's where we're projecting our costs to be and what's that contribution need to be to, to cover that. Um, on the expenditure side, obviously you're, you're pretty aware of a lot of the shifts that are going on in the expenditures. Um, certificated went up for one-time payments. It, um, classified went down. Um, uh, most of the, of the reduction was at first interim, but went down for vacant, vacant CBO position. But then, of course, professional services went up for a number of, of reasons. Um, you know, our contracts, school services doing their search, uh, HYA doing their search, all of those are in that 5,000 category. Um, government Financial Strategies, who does a lot of your bond work and that kind of thing. So those are all in there, but they're one time. And so as we look at the MYP, those one-time costs come out of the 5,000s. The salaries get adjusted back to where the full-time positions would be, the one-time payouts would, you know, come out. So there was um, kind of an inordinately unusual amount of, of adjustments kind of between the salary lines and the contract services lines this year that you would not normally see. Uh, so on the multi-year projections, and I'll... I'll let you guys look at the numbers, and I will um, 
I'll read the footnotes so you can kind of look at um, while I'm talking about it. So property taxes. Oh, I know. I know. It's really. I told you guys, right? I do. One, I have to do one slide that has all the numbers. So hopefully you can read it on your um, on your handout. But actually, I think I have one of these little guys. So um, let's see. So if you look at the the change in the top line going across is going to be pretty much property tax increases. We're using 5% um, next year and 4.5% increase the following year. Um, and again, that's, boy, that's really hard to look at trends. Um, uh, I'm doing a lot of work in Marin County right now, and so they also have a lot of basic aid districts. And the last few years, um, you know, the, the district I'm working in had 7% increase in property taxes and then 6% last year and only 5% this year. But similar to Santa Clara County, what's happened the last few years is Prop 8 reassessments um, up of folks whose property taxes were assessed downward during, you know, 2008, 2009 uh, time frame. And those can kind of, those can all catch up in one year. They're pretty much done throughout the state. So it's really hard right now to look at the last few years and see what everybody's underlying tax rate increases are because there's all these artificial numbers in there. Um, and so we need to be a little careful that we don't show growth if we're, you know, experiencing, even if it's an artificial decline, and so we know better, we've got to be a little bit conservative there. Um, uh, let's see, one day, to, yeah, so in, in 17, 18, this is hard to even see, um, state revenue included, unrestricted included the one-time funds, the $147 this year per ADA, it was removed in next year. On the restricted state money, this this current year has the, the 533000 of prop, uh, Prop 39 energy money, that was also removed in the next year. Um, on the salary side, all the salaries are increased for step and column movement. As I mentioned, the one-time costs for an interim soup and severances, all of those were adjusted back in and out of all of the salary lines for next year. Same with the CBO costs. Stirs and purrs cost increases are in there. And just over this three-year period, Stirs and purrs alone increases, and I have a slide on that, increases about a million and a half dollars over that period of time. Just a cost, you know, 4 and 5% increase in property taxes when compared to 2% stirs and purrs, 2%, you know, 1.5%, 2% step and column, um, you know, any utility increases. I mean, districts around the state are all facing this, whether they're basic aid or not, um, as the rates of property tax growth are slowing, still growing, but the rate of growth is slowing, um, and some of those um, uncontrollable expenditures are, are you know, are increasing. Everyone's feeling the, 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 the pinch across the state, whether they're LCFF funded or basic aid. Um, so, so. Actually, Terry, before you change slides, yeah. when we did the first interim, the reserve numbers you had at the bottom then were right. incremental to the 3% statutory minimum. Is that the same case here? Or this okay, is so what we have now, um, and I think we look back at how it was presented yeah. and trying to make this as, as understandable as possible. So I put in the next to the, the, the line above the green line, okay, would be, that would be our 15% reserve, right, per our board policy. And then the line below that is what's left. So in the current year, we have a little bit more than 15%. We have the 478,000 more, which gives us 16.2. The next two years, I have the 15% kind of required, our own requirement in there, and the amount by which we are short. So when you net those two numbers, because you can't count restricted, because that all has to be spent in a restricted manner, we're only, we go down to 14% and then 12.2, given these assumptions. And one of the big assumptions that, that changed, it's the next footnote I was going to talk about, is has to do with textbooks. And the current year budget has about $750,000 of textbook money in it. And it's about 186,000 of unrestricted textbook dollars, and the rest is restricted. If we spend that all out this year and still want to, as has been, you know, discussed in the past before we came, if we want to continue 750 a year to get caught up on all of our adoptions, we're going to be out of the restricted chunk in the current year, which means we've had to increase the contributions in the next two years to maintain that same level of textbook spending. Now there's a couple of things that could make that look better. One would be we do get one-time money. The only thing you want to spend one-time money on is one-time things and textbooks are perfect. So to the extent we do get one-time money next year, 
we could reduce next year's contribution from unrestricted. Um, if we don't spend all of this year's restricted money, let's say we don't get the whole $750,000 of, of purchase orders processed and received before June 30th, there will be restricted funds that we can spend on textbooks next year, reducing the contribution. Or the board can discuss their priorities, or maybe we get a great deal on textbooks and we don't need 750, 750, 750. That is a lot of money for textbooks. And you know, right now, given our today's assumptions, remember, the math's easy, it's all about the assumptions. The assumption in here is that we're gonna spend three quarters of a million dollars in textbooks each year. And given that assumption, it spends down your fund balance. Because remember, we're not looking at huge increases in property taxes, and we are looking at some pretty large, you know, ongoing costs over which we don't have a lot of control. But just for example, I mean, the 750 is for both of the two other years. I mean, the 750 is only roughly half the operating deficit, right? I mean, it, it, it's almost exactly half in 2018-19. It's a little more than half. Well, in well the operating deficit in 1819 is 794. Well, I'm looking at the. I'm looking at the numbers in green. Net increase, decrease in fund balance. Correct. That's what I'm looking at. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, between total, unrestricted and unrestricted. Yeah. Yes, you're right. You're right. So what else is, is so is it, it, the Stirrers Purse is driving that a lot, or what else? Yeah, yeah the, the unrestricted costs that are going up, right. Um, be, well, because you're increasing the restricted costs for books and supplies, yeah. you run out of funds at the bottom, so then you have to take from unrestricted and move it over there to cover it. So. Um, you're, you're, yeah. So, yeah. And then the other reason, though, that the restricted goes negative is you can see by that second year out, we end up with zero ending balance. At the same time that we're doing the books and supplies, we're also realizing that you've got to spend your restricted money within the next year yeah. or two. So we show it being spent down, even though we not, might not have a plan for it. Our assumption is we spend out our restricted over a two year period. So there's two things going on. One is we spend down this um, this 1.19 million of restricted over those two years, as well as increase our contribution to cover increased textbooks. Okay. Yeah, I'm just wondering. I mean, uh, we don't have to get into this right now, but I mean, clearly our target is the 15% um, yes reserve, and it's we're, we're not projecting that, which is not a problem from a statutory standpoint, but. But it's, it's not a trend that you can continue. It's not obviously. a trend that we want to continue. Right. Correct. So, Absolutely. Yeah. And that's why I know we, you know, we need to talk about. It. You guys need to think about it. We can, yeah. you know, we can talk about assumptions that you want to see in the adopted budget because, of course, we need to do another MYP for the for the adopted budget, which yeah. will then include 2021. We can't see that again. Yeah. So, what are we going to do? Are we going to? Is our priority going to be the textbooks and we take it from something else? Or, I mean, those are discussions we certainly can have here, and, and you need to direct us. Yeah. Um, but but we need to make 2021 look better. So right. so what was that going to be? You know how how are we going to do that? Um, and then the other really important thing, and this was true also at first interim, but I do want to point it out again, is that we have been over the prior years, including this year, transferring in money from our fund 17, just cause, right, to kind of fill any gaps. And fund 17 goes down to zero this year. So that is a big that 800 thousand dollars coming in to the general fund goes away after this year. And that's just a, that you know, that was one-time money, and we've spent it all. Um, so, you know, it's not as bright of a picture, but yeah, at least you have that 15% policy. We're starting with good numbers. We're seeing that trend. We've got time to figure out what do we want to do about it. You know, you could you could do textbook adoption every other year, right? And pull pull one 750 out and. Um, you know what I mean, and, and then, but keep it in 1920. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of things you could do, but I just want to show you the components so that you can think about where we want to go from here. All other funds are here. Yes, you see a lot of red, but that's okay. I mean, we're just, some of those funds we um, have some good beginning balances, and the beginning balance is there so that we can spend down on projects. Um, you know, whether it's, you know, the, the fields or building projects, uh, deferred maintenance, you know, you're going to have monies coming and going in deferred maintenance depending on your needs and your funding sources each year. But everything is, is showing a, a positive ending balance, except unfortunately the Fund 17 pretty much goes, goes away. But other than that, we have positive balances everywhere, which is, which is great. 
And then I did want to include, just because I wanted to know, and so I thought if I want to know this number, you guys probably do too, where are we on some of the facilities projects and are we fully budgeted and, and what's this looking like? Um, and so I have Fund 40 at the top, which, to, which doesn't matter to you. A special reserve for capital outlay is what Fund 40 is. We transferred in about $750,000 from our deferred maintenance fund to go in there. And you can see that we have the whole $3.5 million of Fisher Fields budgeted in there, still leaving a positive $2.5 million fund balance at the end of this year. That's the projection. And, you know, Neil talked to you about we're staying within budget. We need to, we need to kind of identify, identify some of those change orders, but um, in total budget-wise, um, it looks like we're fully, we're fully covered for the budget there. And then the bottom part is within the general fund is the Prop 39 California Clean Energy Act. And you can see the 533 coming in. We've budgeted it to be all spent. Um, whether that happens this year or next year, that still leaves us um, uh, 123000 of Prop 39 money that we have a couple more years to, to get spent. That, that money's not going to be able to be swept for anything else. It's just that's the current budget status of it. We will... We will spend it all, you know. Have you budgeted in the out years or looked at any numbers from the North 40 with the, the agreement we have with them? I mean, presumably they're starting to talk about construction starting next year. And I'm just wondering whether, I mean. No. No. That, I mean. We're both going, hmm, no, I don't think so. <laughs> I mean, we're not what, familiar. $23,000 per unit that's developed. I mean, we get beyond the developer fees. So. Uh, my understanding earlier in the year when people were talking about it is that it will be a ways out, probably past this MYP, to get the actual funds okay. for that. That's I thought it was when they pull permits is when we can start collecting cash. Yes, you collect when they pull yeah. the, before yeah. they get their permit, they have to pay their fees. And we have about a quarter of a million dollars in, that's in Fund 25, Capital Facilities Fund is where our developer fees go. So we are building that balance. Um, but yeah, they, they pay first and then we, we spend it on the growth related items. Are you talking items. about the, the one time or are you talking about the additional tax revenue? That we would be no, I'm talking about actually just the one time. The developer fees. Uh, no, the, I'm actually talking about the, our, the mitigation, our agree, the mitigation yeah. agreement. Okay. Yeah. So there's something on top of or in, in yes. lieu of? Yes. Okay. More Good. than doubles the developer fees. Nice. Good. Well, you need that because developer fees, statutory developer fees don't pay for a whole right. school. Yeah. Yeah, yeah they haven't, I don't even think they've transferred the property for the property tax. Yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah. Even yeah. in the first baseline. Right. Right. Okay. Yeah, we have, we have not been yeah, party to any of those discussions. Any of those kinds no, of and we don't, and we don't do a multi-year projection for the other funds. So if that's something that's going to happen in eighteen nineteen in Fund twenty five, we would not. That's not. We don't project that. Okay, but we need to know for budgeting because now we're getting into budget season. Uh, okay, so we did that. So again, uh, I don't think this is new information to you, but I want to keep it out there. Um, just, you know, kind of the, the, the history over the last few years and, and kind of the, the shocker that's out there. Um, PERS, they've delayed the increases in PERS because last year they had some pretty good returns on it, but they're still, they're still anticipating we're going to get out to that, you know, 28% employer rate uh, range. STRS, uh, we pretty much know what those rates are because they are in statute. PERS has been adjusting theirs every year. so. Try and keep these charts updated, and you know, right as you go to print, they they uh, they change them. But um, you know, and so this is where you know, based on these increasing rates. I mean, look, and I truncated it right. These increases started in thirteen fourteen, but we end up going out on the on the PERS side. Um, the rates that have been published so far are through twenty one twenty two at twenty three point seven percent. I mean, and, and remember, I mean, these were single digit rates not too long ago, just a few years ago. And then on the STRS side, it's been 8.25 since the 80s and um, traveling all the way up to, to 20% on just the employer side. The STRS rates also increase for the employee, not as drastically, but, um, you know, significantly if you're an employee. And um, 
And then the PERS rates, it depends on whether you're pre or post PEPRA. The, if you're before they made the changes, your rate, your contribution stays the same. Afterwards, you have a bit of a higher contribution and less of a benefit plan. So just, again, the graphic, the line would be if, if the rates had stayed the same on what were, you know, and our salaries stay the same, just adjusted for step and column, we'd have the red line, and instead we're showing that we would expect to be paying the blue bar, which, um, you know, everybody can tell that that red line's less than halfway down the blue bars. So that's not good. This is first interim. I apologize. In your mind, replace first with second, and we're still... Um, uh, asking the board to approve a positive certification. So um, I was talking to Trin in the business office this afternoon. I said, well, now we're in budget development, right? Second interim's done. Here we go. Um, and so uh, we'll be, you know, bringing you a, you know, kind of a calendar, some assumptions, and, and, and keep the board apprised, make sure we're coordinating with, with the LCAP folks and um, we don't want one side getting ahead of the other as far as <laughs> commitments, right? <laughs> and um, so the beginning of June, we would expect to have the public hearings on the LCAP and the budget, and then the end of June, have the adoption and approval of said documents. Any questions? I know it went a lot faster this time, but um, I was seeing this, so. <laughs> yeah, no, that's good. I mean, I. I mean, for me personally, I think the, the, the hit, if you will, in the current school year with the all-time well, severance payments and all that was expected, right? So I expected the, the current yeah. school year numbers to look a little different and call it worse than the first interim, but I didn't expect the 18, 19, and 19, 20 uh, numbers to change quite so much. So, I mean, obviously, we're in good health. We need the statutory requirements. I just think that we need to... Um, as we come into the end of the year, just think about what are the budget plans going to be for the next two, three years, and to try to tune them up to meet what we're looking for, you know, for the reserve and all that. But, I mean, I leave it to the financial professionals in the room <laughs> to figure out what that exactly means. I, but I think that's a good summary. Yeah. I think that's true. Um, other? Yeah, I think it's a good presentation. You, you have a good handle on the numbers, which I appreciate. Um, I'd like to be able to see more presentation discussion around the underlying assumptions of staffing levels, what that means for, say, teacher ratios, you know, all the things that actually drive expenses. So when you just see 26 million of things, it's like, I don't know what you're doing. What are the, are we assuming still hiring more people that, that we're letting them go because we don't have, we have declining enrollment? You know, the things that is, in terms of actually the drive a budget. Right. As opposed no. to, because well, when it's just numbers, it's like, I, I right. don't know if you've got a million dollars buried somewhere, you know, that they don't, we're all surprised, right. you know, that right. when the first interim, you go, hey, it's all great because yeah. we found money. And you're like, how did what? you find money? Yeah. And, you know, <laughs> um, and so that's part of, I think, the transparency for, for us, for me, and, and everyone else is the things they understand are teachers, counselors, right. and, you know. Where are the people? And there is, we do have a page in the budget narrative document, which I know is long, but tried to be all yes. inclusive, that kind of does show what the biggest chunk of all those, you know, what our ADA assumptions are, what our staffing assumptions are. Right now, these numbers don't reflect additional. They obviously don't reflect layoffs, so we would be doing that tonight. Um, but we, we haven't had to really get into class sizes yet because we aren't building, we haven't been building it yet. We're just reporting on what we have. Right. That will definitely be something that we'll look at. And, you know, I mean, if we need to start looking at, at staffing ratios, because we have been declining for a while, I'm not sure that we have been adjusting staffing. But, you know, if you lose two here and you lose two there, you're not going to change your staffing. But we will look over overall and, you know, maybe through attrition, there, there are some changes there. We haven't budgeted for that yet. Yeah. But that's something that, um, you know, if, if, if we need to look at it. We need to, to, we need to look at the data and then... You know, I have no decision or or anything at this point. We need to start looking at those yeah, underlying yeah, assumptions. LGF grants says they're up for next year right. and stuff like that. Right. Well, it's just that way you have sort of a discussion because, you know, say a someone comes forward with a new program, whether it's a extra counselor at Fisher or it's a this or that, you can sort of say, well, what are the levers as opposed to just it's it's just numbers, which doesn't tell right. you what you're actually impacting right. other sites or other programs. Yeah. 
I mean, we're, we're kind of um, a small district to come up with staffing ratios for everything, but for teachers, definitely. I mean, that's that's how we staff. That's how we know where to put, you know, one teacher in each classroom. Um, I mean, I mean, when you're modeling it, you're doing it with assumption. I mean, you don't just say, oh, it's just generic. Right. It's right. actually, I'm. I mean, I've been. Yeah, it's like, oh, let's see, how many million should I put in that line? You're doing it actually on a teacher or a staff person by staff person. Yes. The yes. exact step at home for each exact person right. with the right purrs mm -hmm. and stirs and. Yeah. And we can go back and even show that I think I you know I think we have the information. We can go back a couple of years and show, okay, you know we've had, thirty at this school, thirty, 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 thirty teachers, and enrollment has done this or it's done that. We've either increased or decreased class yeah, sizes. Let's look at that. Let's yeah, talk about it. Right. Through attrition last year, right. we were down six staff. So, you know, the way we're staffing okay. is yeah. tight. I, I think that, yeah. that just part of the narrative is very informative as to Absolutely. what are those assumptions because I know we they changed during the year ago process from budget to all of a sudden, oh, we, we approved a contract that should have caused much more pain and that's like oh but we didn't hire the the three people that were in the budget You're like oh didn't okay. know we didn't need those people yeah, we didn't know. right right i think just keep that's where keep, I, keep you apprised people going huh wow you still have all that reserve so yeah okay Anything other else? comments questions alex Steve, yeah. john nope i'm good public comment mm -hmm. okay so um Motion to approve the second interim report. Is there, a, is there more specific language we need? I can't remember. Approve the second. No, just, yeah, just yeah. approve it. Yeah, certified positive, but yeah, yeah. just approve it. I move to approve. Yeah. I'll second. Trustee Collins? All right. Trustee Snyder? Trustee Parsons? Aye. Trustee Parsons? Aye. Trustee Parsons? Aye. 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 Okay, uh, next up, Arcia, for your back-to-back. -back. <laughs> in, in five minutes or less. We always do this to him. We're like, okay, you got two minutes. I'm going to try to be efficient, and if I'm being too efficient, slow me down. But um, Drive careful. Some of the stuff you guys have already heard. So it should be, it should be quick. This is... Uh, Rel this is new, so I haven't uh, presented this information. So this first presentation, I'm going to be a little more deliberate. But uh, I wanted to update. You have a big week this week, and I wanted to update you guys on the ELA adoption process so far. This Thursday, um, the elementary uh, pilot committee is going to meet, and uh, we hope to have a decision on an adoption for, of ELA materials. I'll give you a little background of the process including the pre-pilot process, the pilot process, what we hope to accomplish, next steps, and then I'll, I'll let uh, you guys ask some questions. So we, um, our adoption committee is operating on the general premise that there are no unicorns, okay? There, are, there is no perfect set of materials that are going to meet every single exact need of every single teacher and kid in our district, okay? We all, what we're really trying to do is upgrade the tools that we have for um, our teaching and learning process, so, um, which are outdated. We are um, just finishing up our pilot process. This is the pre-pilot process. So this process actually started early last year where we, uh, I took the um, English department from Fisher plus 20 teachers down to the county office for three visits, really spending literally days looking through every piece of curriculum material that is available, that's on the state adopted lists, and narrowing it down to two that we formerly piloted. Um, we use the state adoption criteria and toolkit uh, to evaluate the curriculum materials to get to this final list, plus additional criteria that we developed as a committee for um, our Los Gatos specific needs. What we selected are both on the state adopted list and include supplemental materials for our, our growing uh, population of language learners. So the, price, the pilot process started this year. Uh, so the 20 plus teachers we took last, we took the entire English 
department, plus there was at least one representative from each grade level in each site. And uh, this year, we as assembled another team of about 28 teachers with representatives from all sites, all grade levels, and each of them, for the two finalists, received a full day publisher training and then had a six to eight week window to try out the materials. And then we, we did the cycle again with the new publisher and another, another pilot window. Participation on this committee was open to all teachers. All CIA reps um, were asked to participate, but any teacher outside of CIA it was open to them, and all teachers received um, information and um, digital materials, any bit of information they wanted or materials they wanted for, for both of the finalists. Uh, the pilot committee will be making the final decision, but will be um, using input from all the teachers that, that experimented with materials and all the um, teachers that have input to give are giving it through the pilot committee. Uh, the goal from the beginning was to establish an impartial process, open to feedback and participation from all teachers that will lead to an adoption by the end of this year. We hope to get materials, hope to get materials in the hands of teachers before they leave for the summer. Ambitious but possible. Uh, I have good news to share. The Fisher Department has uh, closed the loop and completed their process. They went through their pilot of, of what they decided th to pilot and have made a selection, and I'll be sharing that with you at a, at a future meeting. Um, the units of study in writing from Lucy Calkins and Amplify Reading. Uh, the elementary team is meeting Thursday. We're looking for a cohesive K-5 program that will maximize vertical alignment across sites and within sites. Uh, let's see here. Now, it's a two-pronged approach. Once we get the tools, then the um, professional development that goes with it will then uh, be refreshed to focus on the pedagogy that goes with using those tools most effectively. Good Efficient? Good job. Good. Thank you, Rosanna. Okay. I don't have any questions. No, I'm good. I'm fine. Right. I just compliment you on a good process and, and all the yeah. positive feedback we've heard from I've heard from the sites of they really you know they really like one thing and then they're like oh the other one can't be as good and they're like oh wow this is great <laughs> yeah so I think they they all seem really excited about the materials. We're all excited. It's been 17 years since we've done <laughs> our um, ELA materials, so Let's everything, you know, so far <laughs> is going to be. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Next presentation. Next. Yeah. I'm going to take an opportunity to update you. We've done uh, made a lot of progress. Um, my partner Lauren's here uh, towards our LCAP cycle. We've, we're, we're moving along nicely, and I'll update you on what we've done there. I'll talk about how our LCAP is rooted in the eight state priorities. Once again, you guys have seen that. I'll go through that quick. Um, we'll review the goals and actions from last year. You guys have seen that numerous times. We'll go through quickly. Uh, and then the stakeholder consultation timeline, which I've shown you before. I'll just show you where we are right now. And then I'll talk about where we're going, and then we'll um, be done. So here we go, the eight state priorities. Um, all of our LCAP goals and actions must be rooted in these eight. We've talked about it. I've talked about it numerous times. I think we're good, right? Right. Yeah. yeah. Okay, and then the short version of our entire LCAP are three goals, if you remember. Um, the, it's in red at the top, and then all the actions in our current plan that align to that, to that goal. And then with each of the stakeholder groups that I and Lauren and I have met with, we've gone over this slide and asked for ideas, possibilities to add to these actions to support the goal. And we've taken notes on all those stakeholder meetings and we'll be reviewing them as we re write the plan for the update to the plan for this year. So there you have goal two, the actions in our current plan that align to goal two. And goal three, the actions in our current plan that align to goal three. That's it. We have three overarching goals. Um, you guys have seen this before. Again, this is, these are the exact same three slides I use with stakeholder groups. All right, this is the, uh, the, the real update. What I've highlighted in yellow is the stakeholder groups 
that I that we have met with Lauren and I um, starting in the fall the cycle started you know we had a DLAC meeting uh, you guys have heard uh, overview at the board level I've gone over it with principals um, the two unions resource council which some of you also remember uh, we have a DLAC coming up next week and actually our website survey act was released um, this week too uh, the, I'm sure you've seen that it'll be blasted again with the next um, LG USD pride the link will be in there but we actually just even the, within the first hour we had a lot of responses so um, we'll be updating you on that as well and then what's left special ed parents school site councils actually I've started um, with I've done three of the sites there and we'll come back to the board that's our goal come back to the board get approval show you how it aligns with the budget like they were saying and then uh, hopefully we'll get it approved and sent to the county and start the process again just real quick there's yes. no, we don't have an April 27th form meeting is that no, a, it's 23rd 23rd and yeah you're right it's, it would be the next so sometime in May sometime in May okay. yeah 21st is our May board meeting 23rd is our is our, oh 21st 23rd of May. is our April. yeah May so that I think that's when I'm going to send uh, the draft to the county is the 27th no. all right so I'm going to complete the the process but, but April 27th is May oh. 21st or what or no that's not a board 23rd. thing yeah that's incorrect that's incorrect oh, present final draft it's like, a different date. It'll be May. Happening. It'll be May. Okay. It'll be May. No, what is you May won't approve May the final May LCAP until June. That's what I thought. Yeah, it Usually, will be June. Yeah, okay, yeah. yeah. They, no, it will be an update yeah, of the full the document May, that May you'll see in May. Okay. okay. Just for any final yeah, yeah, updates okay, before. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's June. I thought we usually did it like that. It's always yeah. June with the budget. Okay. They're so made. it'll be two parts, uh, Peter. It'll be an initial draft. An opportunity for um, input and then yeah. finalization. Sure. Okay. And then, uh, and then I'll get it to the county. And I'm working with uh, Lauren and I are working with the county as well along the whole process. They're seeing drafts and giving us feedback as well. Q and A. Just a quick question: Many thing earth shattering coming out of meeting with any stakeholders or? Yeah, some stuff, a lot um, with what happened in Florida, a lot yeah, around safety. safety. around the safety aspect of it. Okay. Yeah, which is good because yeah. if all, all of what we've talked about today, you know, we have community stakeholder input justifying our upgrades and, yeah. and awareness okay. and safety. Yeah, I think what it shows is there's a lot of consistency in, you know, when Arcia brought it up the same I mean meeting after meeting you're hearing the same thing mm -hmm. so okay thank you we good good Great. Thanks, thank you for giving me the opportunity yeah. thank you for your concise <laughs> <laughs> okay uh, on to board items uh, number one we have board comments anybody I had my sit down with HYA today to give them my answers to the three questions yeah, me too. Everybody or yeah. You yeah. Guys, Steve, you today or tomorrow? Uh, tomorrow morning. So, yeah, that was, it's good. <laughs> good I did the survey. Did you do the survey? I have not done the survey yet. No. I know they were going off to Blossom and Dave right after mm -hmm. mine. Um, Is that right? Yeah. Mom was going uh, to Lex it's, too. It's I remember looking at the schedule and going, "Holy cow!" Did H Y I get to Lex? Tomorrow. Oh, tomorrow. Okay. They were at Blossom Hill today, though. Yes, but um, I was teaching first grade. We were short of stuff, so. Oh, okay. Aww. Do you know how was the but turnout? I talk fast. <laughs> how how was the turnout? Yeah, mine wasn't. How was the turnout? With the teachers? That Boston Hill, yeah. Um, it was pretty good. I they didn't want administrators in there, so I just yeah, put okay, my yeah. head in there because we have three different lunches. Sure. So and it was a bigger crowd as we okay, good. Well. I like that they are clear, you know, we don't go to the community one. Mm -hmm. It's like they're yeah, very yeah, right. respectful yeah. of keeping it pure so people don't feel like yeah. they're influenced or, you know, uh, feel very comfortable with our choice. Uh, yeah. I've heard a lot of positive feedback from parents, teachers, you know, they, they're excited about it. You know, well, and the words out there, I had a neighbor come over and, act, like, 
make sure I was in, going to attend this, if I had heard of this community meeting, make sure I attended it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've heard of it, but I cannot attend, but yeah. thank you for sharing, so. And they don't have kids, they don't even have kids in the district, so. And so I've received, yeah. I've received here, um, from people in the community, you know, that the, that the survey is out. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, I think that's good that, that community members without kids are, are interested in this. Absolutely. So, yeah. yeah. I like to make sure, I assume we're going to be sending out a actual, just an email that tells people about the, the link as opposed to burying it in LGUSD Pride. Well, it's in the Pride. It's it was in the newsletters in each of the schools. Mm -hmm. and, it's on the uh, website. It's on the website. So three different ways. I'm just saying because we know the open rate for like the newsletter is what 20 percent. You know it. <laughs> yeah, they're going to put it in the wave again. I guess we could. I mean, there's not a reason why we sh shouldn't turn out. Yeah, there's not a reason not to. So I mean, because then we have. I mean, we I don't know where you'd put it. Fifteen different ways to Sunday. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. See yeah there's that. not a reason not to. I mean, or, or even they just <laughs> come out from the principals. You know, each side would be a way that. You know, it's, it makes it connected to your local school, and that, you know, and I have seen that from some of the schools where it's it's listed, right. you know, in their. But if you're plan. saying it's only a twenty percent readership, right. then um, well, then we and can send it out. My wife would never know it's there. I mean. Yeah, <laughs> I it's think in a nice box. Individually, you have the ability to have the subject matter be specific, right? right. Yeah, it's specific to this one thing, and I know that I would open it more likely to open it because of that. Particular we'll send out a blast tomorrow, okay. Michelle. Yeah. Okay. Um, subcommittees reports. Dan and I participated in the Citizens Guide subcommittee meeting of the FAC and at the FAC meeting also. I didn't report the last time, but I've completed MIG two, so I'm gonna I'm gonna try to do three, four, or five in a blast. Wow. Get them done, and then terrible things are terrible. There's tests in five, so. You is that right? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. To make it sound like they're going to like flunk you out of the community before yeah. hey. you don't pass. But. You know, they got three hours stuffed into eight hours. But anyway, we'll get through it. I had a um, I had coffee a couple weeks ago with uh, Rob Rennie. Yeah, it was material. Yes. Coffee with Rob Rennie a couple weeks ago was part of my town liaison activity. Um, that was good. Just kind of talked a bit about stuff. I mean, one of the main things I wanted to catch up on was a uh, topic around uh, teacher housing that had been brought to mm -hmm. our attention by the union and some other folks. I mean, basically, there's a proposal in front of the town council to convert the Ditto's Lane property into a below market slash, I guess, below market affordable teacher housing thing in the jig. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a Habitat for Humanity proposal as well, but the mm -hmm. um, the woman running the the teacher housing Sarah, 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 Sarah yeah. um, just wanted to talk and kind of get her views on stuff. I mean, at, at this point, it's just sort of do you support it? Yes. There may or may not be a need for sort of a, a, what I'll call like a business or interaction between the district and more of a transactional type of thing. Uh, if there is, then obviously it becomes a bigger deal. It's like yes, in theory we like it, and then it's like okay, well. Then what do we really need to do? So we'll have to figure out if there's, no if there's anything there for us. But it's really a pilot. I mean, it's not really a. Yeah, it's a pilot. No, but, but even for the pilot, if we were to have to become landowners or leaseholders or something like that, that's something we'd have to discuss as yeah. an entire group. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. So let's see about 23,000 comes in. I went to the Fisher play. That was great. Yeah, likewise. Yeah. Um, and actually, what was fascinating about that was. Since my daughter was in crew, it was part of the teardown uh, oh, the last yeah. night for two and a half hours. What's amazing in tearing it all apart was how much actually went into doing it. I mean, just I couldn't it's believe the amount of work people Yeah, it's incredible, man. It's incredible. I mean, the, 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 the parents and everybody does, I mean, the, the wiring alone was holy cow. Yeah, right. So, and it was a great, I mean, the kids were great. Yeah. It was a really fun sure. production. So I went to the uh, Lexington Home and School Club and, and, and heard the adult version of what the children did uh, tonight from the, uh, the lexicology. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, and it, it was, you know, they're very passionate about what they do. 
<laughs> well, for the, the green team. The green team yeah. and getting rid of the straws and the packets with the napkins yeah. and the plastic wrapper around them. Mm. Reinforcement here. Anything else? Yeah. My experience with the people are pretty passionate. Yes. So the 26th, we will, we will likely have closed session, right? Uh, I don't know if 5 or 5.30, but we'll figure that out, right? Right. And then the the main agenda item, or the, is it the only agenda item, is we're going to be presented with the superintendent leadership profile, yep. right? 